Hey, welcome, Esoteric Duvidism here. Going to be doing another, basically, public study session. Um, I've enjoyed some of these in the past where I'm basically, the stuff I'm interested in, it's stuff I've been talking about on other streams. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of research on these topics, and I'm just trying to organize it, you know, if, if only for myself. Uh, it's useful for myself just to do this to review these ideas you record it and listen back and organize it for future reference and review if people listen to my speed reading uh, esoteric duvidism i covered a lot of these ideas and it was actually very fascinating because i hadn't read most of those scientific papers before and although i had been doing speed reading you know since a young young boy even uh I hadn't really appreciated the scientific evidence behind it and to read through those papers i think will improve my technique and uh, you know these memory mind uh, skill building techniques and this is uh, pretty interesting this you know i first argued with jf on evolution we talked a lot about consciousness and this is one of my most interesting subjects you know to me this is the single most interesting thing there is and uh you know i first entered school religious school, university, science study. I always had this question in the back of my mind, like, who are we? What is this force driving us? What does consciousness mean? And, and really until I debated JF, I have a whole bunch of books on it. I'm always buying books on the subject. I've read probably a shelf of books, you know, tens of books on the subject over my lifetime. Um, every few weeks, like I'm ordering a book on the subject. My dad probably has hundreds and hundreds of books on this subject. And you know, really, there is no answer to these questions. You know, we're saying the, their philosophy had thought about it for since the beginning of time. We're going to go over some of that. And, you know, obviously now you have modern science of the brain. And we're going to see exactly how much the brain could tell us about thought. And we'll look into correspond these different science, sciences like cognition, intelligence, language, um, sense perception, and uh, the spiritual implications and hopefully i'm going to get more into esoteric subjects and so this is like the precursor for the esoteric subjects is to understand the current nature of knowledge of what is out there so uh i'm going to be doing um screen share mostly tonight if there are people you know, who want to uh you enter or even have expertise want to want to join the call or just want to be in the chat, that's fine. It said afterwards, you know, hopefully tomorrow or the next day, I'll get the table of contents in there. So it'll be very easy and simple for people to uh, watch at their own leisure with the. So let's jump right in, get some information out there. Um, well, some of this I'd went over in the previous one, and uh, you know, there'll be a little overlap, and that's good. You know, we talked about the space memory. So, you know, the mind by mind body problem goes back before Descartes, but you know, here's just some basic uh, background to the subject. Get some information in our head, some framework for this. And some of these concepts we're going to go over a lot, and then we're going to get into some pretty in depth uh, neuroscience cogn cognition. Some of it will be extremely scientific and mathematic. And we'll be looking at uh, very recent scientific papers. So, just the framework conception in order to build information off of a you know, mind-body problem. So you had Descartes in his dualist understanding that the mind was something sp spiritual and there was a physical element. And I guess here you have the substance dualism versus property dualism, where the mind can exist independently and independently of any physical object. Or kind of like the Aristotelian, you know, like the Plato with substance and Aristotle property dualism, where some objects like the brains can have non-physical mental features, but when the object ceases to exist, so does its mental features. So that's basically Plato versus Aristotle, if anyone you know, wants to review the previous stream I had on these issues. And I hopefully I'll put these into a playlist. So you know, just some terms to think about, epiphenomenalism and interactionism. Epiphenomenalism, the physical world is causally closed. The mental cannot influence the physical, that there's a complete separation between mental and physical and no interaction or interactionalism. The mental can influence the physical. 
and the physical can influence the mental. And so, I mean, this stuff's pretty basic, but uh, we'll see this uh, over and over again. So here we have qualia. It's, uh, and, and even it, this is this concept is going to be extremely important. You're going to see it like uh, in basically every aspect of what we talk about. Is it something to have the mental states like seeing colors, feeling happy, um, and that you know just the question is what does this stuff mean to the brain when you say okay I feel happy, I see colors, I count numbers, and you know, to separate these different phenomenon into qualia and try to understand you know from how this uh, fits into the soul or brain, and for most of the scientific studies we're going to be talking about the brain. Parapsychology, is there evidence for the effects on the mental above and beyond the laws of physics? But if there seems to be, is that evidence for dualism or a need to revise the laws of physics? So we're going to talk about evidence for the spiritual realms, and we will get into that. But, uh, you know, not to be too esoteric, I want this to be grounded in uh, science. So commonly today, dualism is not accepted in science. Most people are largely materialistic, although there are a dual of science. There is different understanding because we're going to see the problem of consciousness is not solved. So uh, most scientists are looking for the answers in the material. But there's still philosophy and research and uh, famous scientists that are spiritualist. So a few more concepts that, to go on with monism, that uh, you know, only mind exists, physicalism, only the physical world exists, identity theory, mental states are physical states of the brain, and uh, you know, the arguments for this, mental states can cause physical events, the physical world is causally closed, therefore mental states are physical states. And you have functionalism, mental states are functional states, like uh, software compared to the hardware, Arguments against inverted spectra. Could not my red quail be like your blue quail? Well, our red mental states have the same function roles as our blue mental states have the same functional roles. And then, you know, what about zombies? What's the difference between dead and alive? So uh, you know, there's we're going to be covering a lot of material. And uh, so I'm glad I got some people here. And uh, you're right, Roy, there is... You know, I'm, I'm going to be giving a brief overview of some of the um, historical backdrop, and then we will be looking at the most recent scientific uh, discoveries on the issue. And, uh, you know, so I want to set a little background just to understand this. I found some PowerPoints and was looking through these. And, uh, you know, so let's try to define consciousness. And it's actually kind of complicated. What is consciousness? And you see that science in order to research what consciousness science does not have a clear definition of what consciousness is, nor does uh, even spiritual or mystical systems, you see different world religions, have a different understanding of what consciousness is. Is consciousness something of the individual? Is it uh, you know something of the universe that we just tap into? And uh, so it's we're going to see that there's different definitions of consciousness, and it'll affect the you know, the worldview and uh, scientific research on the subject. You know, so our human nature, we want to classify things, we want to understand things scientifically, including consciousness. So why is consciousness so hard to define as a scientific law? Why is this so elusive? Why is this like uh, one of the last mysteries of science, of consciousness? You, know, you have the all, you have physics, and largely a lot of things appear to be solved, but the consciousness remains unsolved, and a lot of people think it won't be solved. So there's different theories that we're going to get more into. You know, mind, uh, you know, Descartes' mind is immaterial and totally separate from the body, hence uh, science will never be able to figure it out. You know, you have Hume, mind is not divine but natural and physical. In Kant, the mind is physical but has intuition, space and time, mind processes, and orders experience. So, uh, you know, the switch from Descartes to the later rationalists that are going back to this famous Aristotle-Plato debate, you know, because basically most of the people are going to fall into either the camp of Plato or Aristotle in this one. So we'll see studies like consciousness as a, as a state, like whether you're just awake or asleep, 
and there's a lot of studies on like anesthetics and uh, putting people out for surgeries or, or you know sick people losing consciousness. Um, consciousness is an actual place in the brain. Are we going to find the location according to the materialist where consciousness is actually made? Or is conscious just a representational symbol of uh, the totality of who we are in all of our senses, but maybe you know, from a certain reality there is no totality, that's only a symbolic concept? And, uh, you know, linguistics, we're going to get a little into linguistics. So these questions are extremely hard to answer. So I, this PowerPoint's quoting Stephen Rose, who studied the topic. And the, you know, the problem of reducing this. So we, you know, we feel like I am, I'm awake. Um, like uh, Descartes' cognito ergo sum, I think before I am. But in terms of like research, wh what are you going to look for in the human body to demonstrate thinking? You know, it's being aware of one's past history and place in the world, one's future intents and goals, one's sense of agency in the culture of social formations with, in which one lives. So it's a combination of a whole bunch of things. You know, Daniel Dennett, who we're going to see quite a bit of, uh, one of the major philosophers on this subject uh, till today. You know, many people are afraid to see consciousness explained because they fear that if we succeed in explaining it, we will lose our moral bear bearings. In Donald, we cannot be satisfied with a narrow definition of consciousness. It is by its very nature an elusive concept, but is also a scientifically necessary concept without which we would have to invent another term with a similar function. But uh, defining is difficult. You know, Chalmers trying to define conscious experience in terms of more primitive notions is fruitless. One might as well try to define matter or space in terms of something more fundamental. In Minsky, consciousness is one of those suitcase-like words that we use for many types of processes and for different kinds of purposes. It is the same for most of our other words about minds, such as awareness, sent, uh, sentience, or intelligence. Alternatives to definitions, we're going to see some papers today You say just stop trying to define it. Like the physical notion of energy, consciousness has several distinct meanings and requires several different operational definitions, kind of like people who study physics. We don't really know what energy is, but we know that it operates according to you know certain laws like conservation. It can be changed from one form to another. But what exactly is this thing that we call energy? And the, largely, we don't have answers to those questions. As you know, people who saw the philosophy of science, uh, esoteric dualism. So scientific analysis. I've covered this uh, a bunch because we're you know going to try to be scientific about our esotericism. The idea that consciousness is a mode of action of the brain rather than a subsystem of the brain has much to recommend it. Such mode shifts can presumably be timed out by outside observers, providing in principle a unique and determinate sequence of contents attaining the special mode. You know, Minsky chunking, anyone who you know saw my thing on uh, speed reading knows the concept of chunking by now. Um, but in terms of for this research, break the big problem of consciousness down into smaller and smaller chunks by breaking the brain down into smaller units. Chunk the brain itself into understandable pieces, and perhaps a larger understanding will emerge. So attempts have been made to define consciousness. Uh, there's been no universally accepted uh, definition of consciousness. Some people have saying it's counterintuitive to even try to define it. Um, however, you know, to, for moving forward, you know, we want to know what exactly it is we're talking about, what it ex actually is we're trying to figure out, and how we're going to go about this. Okay, so thank God I got 10 people here. Got a minion. Got a lot to go through. I'm probably going to have to divide this into even uh, two, you know, two, uh, two topics or maybe even three. Yeah, okay, so Roy's familiar with Dennett. Yeah, I mean, so there, there. We, we really we have more. Yeah, Dennis, a philosopher, not a science, but he's one of the you know, most quoted on the subject, and we're going to see more of him. So, uh, yeah, let's continue with this. And uh, you know, I got quite a few of these slides that uh, you know just let's pound this stuff through. You know, in terms of memory, see the same thing over in a few different forms, and to get this precursor knowledge really in our head. So then when we're thinking back to these greater concepts. 
we're, we'll know how to uh, fill the information in because eventually you know we're going to start looking at the most modern scientific papers and these historical backdrops and larger concepts as we saw with the speed reading is it going to be extremely important for our progression of knowledge so here we have uh, professor kessler leibniz spinoza descartes cole touring henrik seer and bisson the mind body problem again are we a different person every time you you have a different thought feeling or sensation um, you know, a lot of paradoxes like the Star Trek uh, teleporter, and we're going to see some more paradoxes. So, you know, the dualist solution that we talked about, Descartes, there are, there are two separate things. Descartes was a interactionalist. We're held that the mind, mind and body affect each other. And it could be Plato was more um, not so much interactionalist. <laughs> Pardon me. Parallelism. Leibniz rejected interactionalism. Mind body run parallel like two clocks that tick together. Epiphenomenalism. See that mental events byproduct of physical events. Physical cause mental, but not vice versa. Brain is primary event, and mental is secondary. So you're the monist again. Reject dualist concept. Monis, monism is a form of materialism. Physicalism only bodies exist. Functionalism. Uh, brain creates mind. Something other than the brain could function as a mind, say a computer, that you could understand the mind is separate from the brain and concept, like uh, your computer processing that arises from the processor and look at it as separate, although it's a material thing that arises from the physical. You know, say mental events are identical with physical events, brain events. And idealism reduces matter to mind. Berkeley matter is unneeded uh, inference. So some people actually do the opposite and they reduce the material realm to the spiritual realm and saying that, that uh, it's not that the spiritual rises from the material, but it's the material that rises from the spiritual. And hopefully we're going to get more because that's more esoteric. And uh, although to me, that's, those are going to be better explanations, but I want to get through what science says, you know, in Spinoza, obviously um, went through a lot of this stuff and I'd like to get more into Spinoza in Bertrand Russell, um, modern version of Spinoza. You know, you get qualities, characteristics, aspects, not substance. So, you know, more Descartes. Prove that physical objects exist outside of our mind. You know, say, so I think before I am. Method of doubt to show that all our beliefs about an external world based on our sensations can be doubted. Discovered that he could not doubt that he existed as a thinking thing as long as he was thinking because very time he doubted, thought that he existed, he proved that he existed. You know, so he's trapped in his own mind. So to that extent, it has to be that we exist. And, you know, the famous people know Descartes. Um, and he also tried to prove God existed as exists as we showed before in his meditations and uh, methods on uh, reason. Similar to the ontological argument that we uh, showed, I think, from St. Anselm when I go over that also. So people challenge Descartes, interaction and contradicts conservation of energy law, mounting evidence about the brain and how it operates. Computer shows the computations are due to complex mechanical arrangements and a program that provides instruction. Reducing the body to just a container has implications. Um, okay. So then you had Turing and the, you know, the computing machine. So you see after Descartes, although Descartes is the one who comes up with the Cartesian coordinates that almost every schoolboy learns today with algebra and graphing the lines to the X and Y coordinate system that is really the basis for modern engineering that comes from Descartes. The understandings uh, that uh, came along with that um, offset these formal spiritual systems for how the world operated, and we came up with more and more mechanical understandings for the world operating, and hence you have Alan Turin, the famous mathematician in computer science, and thought, uh, you know, the thought experiments that can computers think like a human if a computing machine can behave in the same way a mind does, then perhaps a mind is a computing machine. 
or at least the brain that produces a mind is a computing machine, perhaps is just lingering prejudice about souls or a kind of egocentric arrogance that prevents us from recognizing that the brain is a very complex organic computing system. You know, further thought on this pattern till today, psychological understanding. You know, the, the metaphysical aspects, uh, you know, from psychology, what, who is the person, who is the human being, who is the me, um, you know, relates to debates like abortion, like gay marriage, all these things could be related. You know, the, the what, what is our real identity? Does our identity rise from the physical or from some spiritual realm? And uh, you, know, what are the moral implications if uh, our mentality does arises from the material as opposed to the spiritual and the soul or some uh, you know God that uh, history and our system as a morals were largely based off of. And you know, so here you Buddhism concept that there is no self. You know, the Atman. You know, that we're we're somehow like part and parcel of the universe of the you know eternal essence. You got the jiva in Hinduism, the soul. So, you know, say there's different understandings of this, and we might get more into Hindu theology as we move on, because in reality, Hindu theology is extremely good at understanding consciousness. So when you get into the left uh, right hemisphere we will get pretty in detail into the brain if not tonight in the probably the next uh, duvidism on this and then you know social identity how does that come out like our identity of who we actually are with the uh... so let me check the chat and be checking the chat in between you have the touring test um yeah, so I'm, I'm just over, you know, we're going to run through a lot of these, uh, you know, basic philosophical. I got quite a few more of these PowerPoints I, I got on the subject. Let's look at philosophy of religion, a little, uh, you know, understanding from the religious as aspect. And review some of what we did in the previous one about the logical proofs of the spirit rule their God and how this new mechanistic nature uh, tries to answer this and a lot of these you know, you know cosmological theological um arguments that that came from you know thousand years ago are actually very true to understanding what consciousness is let's get reason human intellectual abilities our capacity to form beliefs for good reasons on the basis of evidence empirical rational faith the set of beliefs at least some of which are not supported by evidence. Faith goes beyond available evidence. Faith is a gift of God, supernatural. So you have natural theology and dogmatic theology. And yeah, more natural theology that beliefs are established by reason, working independent of any revelation. Although I'm also dogmatic, they'll believe in the prophecy and that. Uh, so we'll see how these work, you know, as we move on. This this tonight tonight's going to be most mostly science, but I want you know want to have this religious uh, backdrop here a little bit, so you know people could read through the lines here. That really uh, the spirituals probably better answer these questions than the scientists are giving. Are given. You got omnipotence, omniscience, immutability, eternally, benevolence, the nature of the divine. You know, the first mover, the greatest, the uh, great causes. And uh, you know, we covered these last time, but, uh, you know, we see the theological argument in its broadest sense in his argument to support the thesis that a universe is designed, not necessarily the creation of a theistic God. When the Greeks spoke of a cosmic designer, they obviously had no idea of the God conceived by the Jewish, Christian, Muslim traditions in examining the design. Therefore, we need to divide into two parts. Firstly, the argument in support of a theistic design, d God, and second, the argument in support of cosmic design. That so you could look at the universe and you could see that there is a God, there is a designer. And then on a more personal level, maybe you could see that that designer is the same designer that is the God of a specific religion. 
So it's important to be aware under the term theism, there exists a diverse range of polytheistic and monotheistic beliefs. However, in this particular argument, as it was developed in the 18th century, theism was usually understood as reference to the classical concept of God as elaborated by Thomas Aquinas and mo most commonly understood by the Catholic and Anglican traditions of the period. Briefly, God is perceived as single, omnipotent, omniscient, and benevolent. And this is also the orthodox view for Jews and Muslims. So the argument, the purposeful organization of man-made object is evidence of the intelligence and purpose of the maker. The world contains many natural objects whose organization is clearly purposive and the world itself is purposely organized. The conclusion by analogy, there must be a maker of the universe who has made it according to a plan. The world maker creator is God. And then you have the famous William Paley that we went over a few times now. And, uh, you know, the intelligent clockmaker Example that we've dis discussed quite a few times that watchmaker, the the precise making of such a, a complicated device implies that there was a maker, and you know that uh, parallel from the world implies that there's an intelligent designer of the whole world. So the arguments against the theological proof of the existence of the theistic creator, you have the cause and effect argument. Adopting the empiricist approach, our knowledge of cause and effect is based on our experience. For example, you know that if you cut yourself with a knife, then you will bleed and feel pain. But how do you know this? Whatever the source of your knowledge, the fact is that you were not born with this fact. It is not innate knowledge. You had to learn it. So how can we be so sure that this world is so perfect? How many worlds have you seen? This world, if it was made by a creator, could actually be something of a botched job compared to other worlds. However perfect it may seem to us, we only have this world and now a few others we partially explored in this solar system to go on. You know, we get on later with, uh, you know, the philosophy of science that I talked about that uh, we could really only know a very little amount. And because we recognize the limited knowledge that we have, um, you know, so there's different approaches to empiricism and maybe the spiritual approach is, you know, like Plato, that the best source is to tap, a tap, uh, tap into the divine. <laughs> Like the Bible might say, both approaches. So either the problem of evil, and uh, you know, I went over Leibniz and his uh, best of all possible worlds. In the you know the Epicurean trilemma, and now you have chaos theory, which is going to actually going to come into uh, the how the brain works because a lot of uh, suppositions about how the brain works now is coming into chaos and the electric networks. Anyone who studies advanced mathematics, you'll know about chaos theory, and we'll be, go more into that. But another significant scientific theory that may undermine the whole world design argument is that the belief that the universe is not really all that ordered at all. As quantum theory developed early in the century, it became clear that the microscopic level physical processes were indeterminate. They were not predictable. Over the past 30 years or so, it has become clearer that the motion of many physical systems are not as regular as Newton has suggested. In other words, nature is not as mechanical as the machines we make at all, and therefore the analogy does not work. Such a theory also lends to support Hume's thesis that there is no obvious sense in which the universe resembles human production. In fact, it could be argued that human production is better than the universe, which is why we feel the need to produce things in the first place. So, you know, how chance factors into what we see. In the modern understanding of sciences, there's a lot of chance there's a lot of unpredictability. So with the cosmological argument, something cannot be caused uh, of itself, something not come from nothing. There cannot be an infinite series of causes and effect, which is similar to Aristotle. So Thomas Aquinas. So the existence of God self-evident. Is it just obvious that there's a God? Um, can it be demonstrated? So, you know, the Epicurean trilemma, if, you know, God is basically self-evident, like to me it's self-evident, there's there's a God, there's a spiritual force that I'm in contact with, but then, okay, what about the problem of evil? And uh, everything in the world can be accomplished by a few principles. The process of the world can be accounted by other principles. Natural things can be reduced to one principle. That is the principle of nature. All voluntary things can be reduced to one principle. Human 
reason and will there's no need to suppose the existence of a god which is you know now the mechanistic that uh you know to me god is obvious the spiritual elements and even like i talk and pray to the creator it's obvious to me but someone who's succumbed to reason and uh, observation could say they could explain everything that i could explain through these natural processes so we had the before argument of motion efficient cause possibility and necessity gradation to be found in things governance of things i'll read through these again just because they're important and it's going to affect how we move forward in trying to understand consciousness uh, argument from motion would it not be much easier to say that there is a beginning let's be empirical when we observe the world we see that everything has a cause the rain causes the plants to grow the plants cause the production of oxygen action causes animals life to exist etc 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 does this not follow that the whole universe too has a cause aristotle rejecting plato's concept of forms believe that everything must have had an efficient cause the efficient cause was the unmoved mover or what we call god the efficient cause aristotle was a major influence on thomas aquinas who developed the ca causal arguments as part of his christian beliefs basically aquinas stated the a causes b and b causes c then a is the first cause and c is the last cause but what happens if a does not occur neither b or c will occur the causal chain must therefore have a beginning and that ultimate beginning is god as i discussed in the first uh, chapter of duties of the heart possibility to necessity in nature things that are possible are either um, to be created or not to be they are destroyed it is impossible for them to always exist if it is possible then at one time that they could not have been nothing in existence for something to exist existence begins by something already existing like i argue from jeff life comes from life at one time nothing was in existence it would have been impossible for anything to have begun to exist and now nothing would be in existence but there are things that exist therefore not all being are merely possible but must be something which existence is necessary Every necessary thing is caused by another. We must admit the existence of some being having itself, its own necessity, God causing others to exist. So, you know, saying, could you have the uncreated world? And is the uncreated creator easier to believe in the un uncreated world? You have the argument for, for a perfection. Things in this world are in gradation. Less or more good, noble, hot, therefore. There must be something that is best, noblest, hottest, and something which is most being perfection and there's god something beyond gradation and it's also an argument brought in uh, the first chapter of duties of the heart on the oneness of god governance of things things that lack being imperfect as natural bodies act for an end to obtain the best result they achieve their goal by not chance but design who ordered things in their end directed them god in the same way that the arrow is directed by the archer the ontological argument the necessary being saint anson defines god is that which nothing greater can be thought god is the greatest possible thing we can act, we can conceive logical argument is a reduction to absurdity the negation of the conclusion leads to absurdity the concept of god of being no greater than which can be conceived but being which exists is greater than a being which is merely conceived if god does not exist god would be a being no greater than which can be conceived therefore god exists you have actually listened to popper and falsification you could uh, tie those two together so ansem's main points of his argument two types of existence we can conceive of things that exist in reality but we can also conceive of things that do not that which exists in the mind could possibly exist in reality so if we could think about it it must be that there's a some sort of potential for it to be the fact that we're able to conceive of a being that is capable of forming acts that we as mere mortals are not at least points to the possibility even if you are unable to understand all of its attributes things that exist in reality are greater than those exist in the mind and some suggest that if you can conceive of something greater in the mind and that there is the possibility that it exists then its existence would be greater than the figment of someone's imagination god only exists in the mind if we accept the definition of god of being that which none greater can be conceived we can also accept the argument that a being that exists in reality is considerably greater than the one that exists in the mind then god must exist god in reality is far greater than god in the mind god exists both in reality and in the mind provided we accept the possibility of the greatest being and that which exists is reality is greater than that which exists in the mind then god as the greatest being cannot exist only in the mind and you know obviously the problem of evil as a possible refutation to these proofs that uh, you know this greatest being then how could there be evil 
So, you know, we, we I talked a lot about Leibniz on this. Thomas Aquinas admitted that existence of evil is the best argument against the existence of God. A tension exists between the beliefs about evil and the characteristics of the classical theistic view of God. You know, omnipotence, God is perceived doctrinally as all-powerful, but immediately we can see problems with this and that the, you know, Descartes, that God could do anything, can he square a circle, um, build a rock that he can't pick up, and hence we have Leibniz's answer of the best of all possible worlds, theodicity, calculus, omniscient, and uh, omnibenevolent. So, you know, I encourage you to go back to my other lecture and look at Leibniz's uh, theory of theodicity and look more into that. Hopefully have more time to talk about that. Um, but, you know, the point here that we're doing tonight is try to understand consciousness and this, uh, you know, that thinking that, that it might arrive from the spiritual realms and the logic and scientific thought behind it is important. And when we start examining all this physical material evidence about the brain, and I will be continuing, at least personally, and I assume most of the people watching me will have a more spiritualistic interpretation. So I want to get this out here. In Buddhist tradition, we see an intuitive understanding of what it is that contains no divine figure. This vision of the simultaneous existence of all that is, has been, or will be, only time stands between them. A lot of physicists believe that the Eastern tradition is more closely in tune to quantum theory and uh, what the latest scientific evidence is uh, pointing to. The Eastern mystics see the universe as an inseparable web whose interconnections are dynamic and not static. The cosmic web is alive. It moves, grows, and changes continually. Modern physics, too, has come to conceive of the universe as such as web of relations, and like Eastern mysticism has recognized that this web is intrinsically dynamic. The dynamic aspect of matter arises in quantum theory as a consequence of the wave nature of subatomic particles and is even more essential in relativity theory where the unification of space and time implies that being of matter cannot be separated from its activity. It seems that scientists and mystics sometimes use a common language to describe what both agree is in many ways indiscernible. The inner essence of reality, like Anson Aquinas and Paley, Christian mystics claim knowledge of God, their certainty arises not only out of the linear logic of reason, but intuitively based on their experience. What they know cannot be proved, but then again, much of what we know about the world cannot be proved either, at least not using <coughs> the traditional methods of science. So, you know, last thoughts on atheistic worldviews, going back to the Greeks, Protagoras. If a god of theism does not exist, then all meaning might be said to derive from human values. According to Protagoras, without God, a man is the measure of all things. Without a personal God, we might conclude that all creative and technological accomplishments are monuments to human potential and should be celebrated as the legacies one generation leave to the next so that continuous progress is possible. We are responsible to ourselves and to our fellow travelers to behave responsibly and to be true to our human nature. The purpose of life is what we bring to it, our dreams and hopes for a better present and brighter future. The purpose of my life is whatever I decide it should be. When I die, my consciousness will die with me. My contributions to human knowledge and the creative spirit, as well as the people whose lives I have an influence, will be my immortality. While they live and while my accomplishments endure, I will not be forgotten. My children and grandchildren are my legacies for the future. Okay. Good stuff. Keep on pounding through this. Try to really understand this. So, see if uh, anything interesting in the chat. I'm, I'm just going over the most current knowledge. Like I'm, 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 you know. So, so when we converse, we have to have the framework to talk with each other on these issues. So, you know, like uh, you see, what are we saying new? What's different? So, you know, let's keep on pounding through this to really, you know, drive this in. So here, you got the, you know, the problem of consciousness. So what is consciousness? Consciousness presses the, pose the most baffling problem in the science of the mind. There's nothing that we know more intimately than conscious experience, but there's nothing that is harder to explain. 
Consciousness is not synonymous with the mind. The confusion has led to the loss of some of its mysteries. Throughout history, mysteries that have plagued scientists' minds have dwindled away, and we have lost interest. Inversely, the mind-body problem continues to grow and capture our interests. So consciousness, you know, say like the colors we perceive in our mind, the ability to share. Some monist theories emphasize that just mental and belief objects are just perceptions of the individual's mind. Um, you know, what is reality? You know, the, the whole concept of consciousness is related to empiricism and the scientific method and what is reality and how do we get at it. Problems arise as to how two human beings could agree to a physical object when the object is outside of their mind. Material monist theory say that there is only matter and everything is just a physical state. However, this takes away from the thought that humans have control over their fate and future. Epiphenomenalism again, the idea that mental states are produced by physical events but have no causal role to play. Physical events cause mental events, but in turn the mental states don't have any causal effect on the physical future. But then how can we speak about consciousness if our conscious thoughts don't have any influence over our physical outcomes? Panpsychism. You know, the mind is fundamental, matter is associated with the mental, that uh, the opposite of materialism, that mind arises from matter, but that matter arises from mind. And you know, again, Cartesian dualism, the problems of dualism, that uh, Gilbert rule argued that when we talk of the mind as an entity that does things, we are making a mistake and said he saw mental activities as processes, or the properties and dispositions of people. Minds are simply what brains do. The mind carries out the function of the brain. Two notable dualists were Sir Karl Popper and neurophysiologist uh, Sir John Eccles, who gave us a modern theory of dualist inner actionalism that hopefully we'll discuss more, argue that the critical processes and the synapse of the brain are so finely poised that they can be influenced by non-physical thinking and feeling self, that the self really controls the brain. That, uh, you know, be like the brain is a receptor for the divine, for the spiritual. So your different attempts to define consciousness, you have psychology in the last 200 years, and really, you know, the more recently even became a hard science, William James, to miss the dualist concept pointed out that consciousness can be abolished by injury to the brain or altered by taking alcohol, opium, other substances. Certain amounts of brain physiology must be included in psychology. Uh, James coined the term stream of consciousness to describe the ever-changing flow of thoughts, images, and feelings. Uh, psychophysics was a study between physical stimuli and reportable sensations, your outer and inner experience. Ernst Weber and Gustav Fischer studied the relationship between physical luminance and perceived brightness, weight and sensation of the heaviness, and sound pressure and loudness. And we see a lot of study till today uh, focuses around sense perception, consciousness as uh, the result of sense perception, and that in some point, uh, a lot of you know, saying that actually could be the end of it, God forbid. So yeah, Helmholtz tried to measure uh, he was the first person to try to measure these nerve signals. He proposed the idea of unconscious interference based on tricks our senses and visual illusions can make. And then your Herschel wanted to focus on the things themselves. Every subjective experience is an act of reference. Conscious experience are about objects or events, but physical objects are not about anything. And we saw that the other day in uh, the school's uh, logical positivism. Introspection, Wilhelm Wundt, father of modern psychology, we'll be seeing more of them, study the subjective experience by introspection. He wanted to be able to build a psychology based on studying from the inside. Wundt claimed that there are two kinds of physical elements, the objective element or sensations such as tones, heat or light, and the subjective elements of simple feelings. Every conscious experience depended on the union of these two. Introspection fell out of favor because one person's claim to an experience can be quite different from another person's experience. There's no agreement. So your behavioralism um, became popular. Branch could be measured. Your behavioralism was the most scientific form of uh, psychology. And you had Watson argue that psychology did not need the methods of introspection. Indeed, could do without the concept of consciousness altogether. Many of Watson's ideas were built in the groundworks of Pavlov, 
whose works include the study of reflexes and classical condition. Skinner's studies of rats and pigeons shaped the history of reinforcements. These new findings led to a personal period of abolishment of consciousness. Behaviorism succeeded. Success led to the avoidance of consciousness. They say, you know, maybe consciousness, God forbid, doesn't even exist. And it, it is just mechanical and we really don't have free will and only respond to uh, biological urges and sense perception. Then in cognitive psychology, uh, as behaviorism started to fade, cognitive psychology came back. You know, it's pretty hard, <laughs> cold, hard world to not believe in consciousness. However, consciousness still was you know, discarded as not welcome in psychology because of the looseness of the term. Different senses, consciousness could mean different things. More information from research on mental imagery, altered states of consciousness, such as sleep and drug-induced state, hypnosis, computer science, consciousness began creeping back into our vocabulary. Many problems that have plagued us in the past have been solved either through new inventions or thinking. Consciousness is one that remains as much as a mystery as it, as it has throughout history. And back to this concept of qualia that we're going to see um, really is part of the most modern research on these qualias. These are private qualities you only experience privately, incapable of being expressed, because only you experience it in your own way. A qual is what something is like. Our conscious experience consists of qualia. Now the problem becomes how are qualia related to the physical world or how an objective physical brain can produce subjective qualia. Duals believe that qualia are part of a separate mental world from physical objects. Ideals believe that everything is ultimately qualia. Epiphenomenalists believe that qualia exist but have no qual causal properties. So the problem of qualia, they don't have a physical properties that can be measured. Qualia is something separate from the brain. Do qualia make any difference? Does a qual contain information above and beyond the neural information it depends on? Yeah, I mean, so you have these uh, thought experiments, the Mary thought experience from Frank J Jackson for the person who never saw red. You have the zombie experiment, you know, someone who had the same body but not our consciousness, you know, like the Star Trek uh, transporter issue. And, uh, you know, just these thought experiments are, are useful to understand. So the hard problem is insoluble. The problem is subjectivity is, hope of, is hopeless. Our human kind of intelligence is wrongly designed for understanding consciousness. Our, our own awareness is the ultimate tease forever beyond our conceptual grasp. Stephen Pinker. So how are we going to solve this unsolvable hard problem of consciousness? You know, how do we know what this is, you know, we all basically have some understanding consciousness. We know what it is because that's who we are, cognito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. But what is this? So we got to rethink about what we know about the universe. We can only understand consciousness when we have a new theory of information. Fundamentally, rethink nature of the universe. So there's the easy problem of consciousness. We're going to get more into that with Dennett. And, you know, those like certain like sense perception, um, like optics, understanding vision, processing, language. <clears throat> and we understand these more easy problems for how we experience certain things or do certain things within cognition. And that maybe will lead us to uh, answering the hard problem or maybe we'll see that there actually is no hard problem. And the hard problem is only made up of all of these easy problems put together. So start with the easy problem. Solutions to the easy problems will change our understanding of the hard problem. So trying to solve the problem now is premature. Solution to the hard problem would only be of use if we could recognize it as such. And for the moment, the problem is not well enough understood. So disassociation between fast motor reaction and conscious perception. Experiment of showing... Uh, okay, we're going to get into a lot of this evidence. And, you know, the, here we're going to divide action into five types, conscious, unconscious. So our, certain things are always unconscious. Some actions that are normally carried out unconsciously can be brought back under conscious control by giving feedback of their effects. 
Many skilled actions are initially learned with much conscious effort. Many sk such skilled actions, once well learned, can be done either way. Some actions seem always to be done consciously. Your functionalism, mental states are functional states. Someone in pain, input from damage alone. Other mental states like desire for the pain to go away. Most common view works well with explaining mental states but cannot deal with phenomenal consciousness and the artificial intelligence. If we could do the same functions as a conscious system, it would also be conscious. And then the global workspace theory. Cognitive system is built on a global workspace or blackboard architecture analogous to the stage in the theater of the mind. Unconscious processes, processes compete for access to the spotlight of attention that shine on the stage from where information is broadcast globally to the unconscious audience. The global broadcast constitutes consciousness. Actions that were performed consciously are shaped by conscious feedback, while uncon unconscious actions are not. Okay, so it's a lot of information. You know, this thing, this is going to be a really, really big topic. You know, it's pretty baffling. Um, so, you know, I, I want to give quite a few of these overviews. And then uh, you're saying there's, you could fill up libraries and libraries of scientific information on this. So, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to uh, create the, your know, greater framework to understand this and to put more information into I got a few more a few more PowerPoints. Here's part two of this. Yeah, let's look quickly. Eastern versus Western concepts of the soul. So the ancient Greeks, Plato, Socrates, Pythagorean, souls rational, emotional, ghostly entity that breathes life into the body, departs at death, reincarnated. Aristotle's soul is activity of the body, source of rationality. Intellect of soul persists after death. You had Western monotheism, Christian Islam, Judaism, Baha'i, body infused with soul by God at conception, restricted to humans. Soul has no past, but persists after death in heaven or hell, depending on whether you are a true believer and a good person. Western mysticism, Kabbalah, three souls, lowest shared with other animals, upper two persist after death in, in uh Reunited permanently upon resurrection. Gnosticism, three souls. Unification of upper two in realized Gnostic is followed by their union with the source at the end of time. Unrealized folks go nowhere. And Sufi high states of souls is the merger with the divine. In Western materialism, soul doesn't exist. Personality, morality, intellect are epiphenomenon of the brain and body. Hinduism, a street entity called the jiva or atman, persists from life to life, reincarnation, found in all beings, governed by karma. Two main schools, Advaita and Dvaita. Advaita, atman is part of or one with the divine. In Dvaita, atman is separate from Brahman. Atman is indivisible and unchanging. Jainism, all beings have a discrete, unending soul that persists from life to life. Souls go to heaven or hell according to karma, but these are not permanent states. Highest state of soul is attainment of a permanent state of bliss. Buddhism, no distinct permanent self. Uh, Anatman, it's constantly changing. Believe in reincarnation, not discrete souls, but ever-changing localized currents in a sea of consciousness, governed by karma, cause and effect, ultimate goals to end the cycle of birth and death by ending attachment, thereby ending one's apparent illusory separateness from the underlying Buddha nature. And then Taoism, all people have multiple malleable elements, which may be thought of as souls. These come from various sources, including one's parents, the idea in Taoism is to achieve harmony or balance between the souls. Yeah, okay, so just throwing in some religious stuff here and there. So let's get to, you know, consciousness in the world. So you have more... You know, what is attention? Attention. Truth or perception of the world is neither required nor necessarily attempted. Conscious experience focuses on gathering information quickly. Details are filled in to give us a sense of continuity to our perceptions. The point of paying attention in general, concentration. So you have attention and timing, attention and consciousness, directing attention. You know, like the Leibitz theory of a half second delay. What's the correlation or connection between attention and consciousness 
William James, does consciousness cause awareness? Does awareness cause consciousness? Do they affect each other at all? It is the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneous possible objects or trains of thought, you know, free will. My experience is what I agree to attend to, firmly believe we have the ability to control our consciousness through free will. Possible we simply think we have control of our experience. We assume a choice was made because attention shifted, not because we made it. You have filtering attention, so you have dichotic listening experiences, attention switch between ears to follow message without subject noticing, Broadbent's theory, subconscious filters, parallel processing streams to produce focused serial outcomes. So other models can claim attention. Many may simply allocate more resources and add a spotlight. Attention is very complicated, might not even exist. Cause and effect theories. Attention decided by other brain cells or some spiritual force. The effect theory, brain cells guide brain cells. Cause theory forces guide brain cells like the brain is a receptor to something spiritual similar to the difference between physicalism and dualism could have defend either side well so he chose cause theory due to personal bias that william james the founder of like modern psychology uh, did believe that there were spiritual forces that cause consciousness and we talked about these visual saccadas when about speed reading uh, directing attention like the eye and focusing attention on something and in, in perception wise it could be voluntary but normally it's not voluntary smooth pursuit is never voluntary even though we are tracking the object the target it kept on the fovea automatically lots of other involuntary bodily movements occur like rotating the head or torso you have selective attention hemholtz again the founder of applying electricity to the brain premotor theory Giving attention to a certain spatial location involves neurons that guide actions toward it. If attending to a location on your right, neurons are activated. That would be used to turn to the right and do something. Pop-outs, like uh, you know, noticing the O, something that looks different, immediately coming to attention, you know, what uh, doesn't belong. Leave its half-second half delay, electronically stimulated patients, some at a century, cortices during surgery. At that intensity, a half second of continuous stimulation before any perception. Um, we could measure reaction times in milliseconds. So, you know, what's the effect of uh, sleep or surgery or uh, anesthetics? So, Liba concludes consciousness requires neural adequacy to occur. Brackwood referral challenges materialism, the idea that consciousness equals certain brain activity. Um, they thought that that data supports dualism. When a noise is heard, it is processed unconsciously very quickly. We become conscious of it only after turning. Can still make some decisions consciously. So we see that, uh, you know, really we perceive things quicker than we understand that we perceive them. So there's you know certain uh, phenomenon that uh, that where our brain perceives reality different than it might be, and you know this concept of theaters of the mind, Cartesian dualism. So the Cartesian theater, the Hume says the mind is a kind of theater where several perceptions successively make their successively make their appearance. What is on stage is in consciousness. Do you feel like you just sit in your head and watch the world outside? Is imagining like playing a fictional film instead of the real world? Cartesian materialism. Dennett rejects the Cartesian theory, theater and Cartesian materialism, claims most materialists still believe in something like the Cartesian theater. Cartesian materialism is what he calls the implied belief in uh, the The Cartesian theater, despite materialistic rejection of the dualism, any notion that there is a place where consciousness happens suggests the belief in Cartesian dualism. So can you locate consciousness? Many of the brain's are, areas are correlated with certain kinds of processing. Stimuli enter the brain through the senses. The brain processes and behavior results. Consciousness does not appear in one place. Consciousness does not appear at one time. Then it says we cannot ask the questions without believing in the Cartesian theater. 
So the mental screen, Shepard's 71 experiment, the time to rotate a block in the mind is proportional to the degree of its rotation, suggests we recreate the world in our head, just like the idea of a Cartesian theater, not a proof of conscious imaging. We rotate objects every day without noticing some part of the brain active, whether imagining or consciously viewing. And anyone who's taken IQ test, intelligence test, a lot of it includes things like this uh, mental object rotation. And that we talked about more global workspace theory bars, the theater metaphor with a bright spot on stage, unconscious contextual systems process information in the shadows to affect the events that occur in the bright spot. Each part of the theater is a different aspect of consciousness. Senses and ideas are actors. Memories, interpretations, and automatonisms are the audience. Consciousness without the theater, so you'd leave its theory of neural adequacy. Most events do not reach the level necessary for conscious experience. That our brain processes a bunch of stuff, but whatever is consciousness, those things, if you call it subconscious or operate um, without making it to the main stage. Crick's astonishing hypothesis, one sense of self is merely the result of interactions between neurons and molecules. Stimuli are con consciously perceived if cells fire and synchrony to great reverberatory circuits. Multiple drafts. Tanner proposes that everything in the brain is under constant revision. Perceptions and ideas are always present as multiple drafts at various stages. There is no point in asking which are conscious because this implies the CT exists. The sense of narrative stream arises only when a question is presented and answered. Drafts can affect behavior in the way and leave traces in memory, but there's no actual experiences that occur. The grand illusion, filling in the gaps, change of blindness, inattention, blindness. Illusions are the things that are not what they appear to be. Most people believe that seeing is a conscious stream of moving images, represents the world. Why do only parts of our visual experience become conscious? Why should any of what we see be an authentic representation? You know, what's really out there versus what we see, what we perceive, what's inside our head? Filling in the gaps when part of an object is obscured, we infer the missing information. Visual stimuli are pixelated spatially and temporarily, but our perception is not. Rods and cones are individual cells. Cells responsible for changing stimuli take place. Blind spot is a significant gap, but we never see a black hole. So the implications, imagine a room full of identical pictures repeated over and over. The visual perception is that all are in focus, even though that is impossible. Then there's no photocopy effect. The brain just guesses after the first view. If one picture is different, a brief glance is not long enough to notice it. So more filling in. You got uh, Raman Chandra's subject, uh, Josh, in the blind spot, presented vertical lines above and below. He could actually see the gap close. Offset lines. So change blindness. People often don't notice minor changes between two pictures. This is especially true if you don't see them at the same time. Subject scanning text will not notice changes outside his focus that are very obvious to others. Differences in altering images are found more quickly if the change is in an area of interest. In inattention blindness, subjects told to attend to one area will actively inhibit attention elsewhere. Focus and attention are not the same. In the fovea is centered on a fixation point, attention can still be directed to the side. We will notice the stimulus at the fixation point, even though the eye is directed right at it. You know, the famous uh, gorilla experiment. Vision theories. From each fixation, we get a gist, which we compare to later gist. If the gist are similar, we don't notice any changes in detail. Low-level processing creates a coherent field for each object. Virtual representation creates a rich experience without utilizing all information. No need to store everything because the brain can call on the world as a kind of external memory. What's vision's goal? Truth perception of the world is neither required nor necessarily attempted. Conscious experience focuses on gathering information quickly. Details are filled in to give a sense of continuity of our perception. That's the point of paying attention in general to concentrate on what's important. Okay. Still got eight people here. Yeah, this is pretty intense. You know, I'm glad to go over this stuff. Hope to learn a lot. And uh, there's a lot of information here. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to create the framework. To, it was a week ago, more in depth. And you see, there's just a lot of concepts. So I, you know, I actually have, you know, way more than I'm going to do tonight. So I just pulled, pulled out what I'm 
capable thing I'm doing tonight. You can see all the tabs on the top of my computer that, uh, you know, those are scientific papers. So I'm just getting through the PowerPoints and uh, you'll get these concepts as good as possible. And uh, so let's look at the more theories of mind, philosophy of mind, the area of philosophy that deals with the topics that in one way or another relate to mental life. The most commonly identified core question in the philosophy of mind is, what is the relationship between human mental life and the human body? Or what is the relationship between the mental life and the physical world? 20th century shift. Um, began with the dominance of philosophy focused on language, logic, mathematics, and epistemology. The philosophy of mind was largely seen as a posterior to discussions of language and epistemology. Two shifts occur in the philosophy of mind as the 20th century developed. First, philosophy of mind became an interdisciplinary subject. Currently, it is possible to study the philosophy of mind without knowing a great de deal about computer science, phonology, neuroscience, linguistics, cognitive science, traditional philosophy, non-Western philosophy, such as ancient Asian techniques of meditation. Second, language and epistemology are now seen to be less basic than philosophy of mind. Questions about how language works and how we know things are taken to be dependent in part on how the mind works. We now think of inquiring into the mind as a way of learning about language and knowledge. Problems, the mind might not equal the body. Person can only perceive another person's body. So a person cannot perceive another person's mind. The solipsis question, how do I know there are other minds even out there? The non-uniqueness questions, how do I know that my mind is not completely unique? Even if there are other minds out there. And the animal question, do non-human animals have minds like humans? Problem of free will. If the mind does equal the body, the body is governed by laws of nature. Either laws of nature are deterministic or indeterministic. If laws are deterministic, there's no free will. If laws are indeterministic, then my actions are random. So you have the illusion question, is free will an illusion? Morality question, how can there be more responsibility without free will? Punishment question, if bodies are governed by deterministic laws, why are we punished? We could not have done otherwise. So the problem of the self and personal identity, if myself equals my body, then what happens to my body also happens to me. My body undergoes physical change constantly. My self does not appear to undergo physical uh, change constantly. Therefore, the self can't equal the body. So the continuity question, if there is something I fundamentally am, what is that thing underlying me throughout all the changes my body and mind undergo? Responsibility questions, there is no continual self. How is it that I can be held responsible for something I did in an earlier time when that person is not around any longer? And the problem of intentionality, intentionality or, or aboutness is a pervasive component of human life and essential to understanding the human condition. Intentionality allows us to think at one location or refer from one location to something that's not, that is spatially distant or temporally distant around us. Some think that intentionality is the mark of mental phenomenon. How is it that thoughts inside my head can reach out beyond my head and refer to something very distant in space and time? More generally, how is it the phenomenon of aboutness possible in the physical world, one of the arguments I gave to JF. Questions concerning emotion and rationality. Uh, what is emotion? What is it to be rational? Are actions guided by reason or by emotion or by both? What's the specific analysis of an emotion such as anger? Are there different kinds of rationality, practical, theoretical? Can reason influence emotion? Can emotion override reason? Questions concerning mind reading. How do I know what another person is doing or trying to do? How does ought Autism help us understand human mind reading. What do mirror neurons, what role do mirror nor, neurons play in expanding our understanding of another person's behavior? What evidence, evidence can we use to decide between competing theories of mind reading? Questions relating to AI, artificial intelligence. Can computers think? What criterion is appropriate for answering the questions of whether computers can think? What can we learn about human cognition by studying ways in which we can program computers to learn? What are the more boundaries of AI? Does mathematics provide a counterexample to the idea that computers can perform mental tasks equivalent to human? In a, is the singularity coming? What does the singularity suggest about the nature of mindness? More questions. Mental states. What's a belief, desire, intention, attention, perception, memory? So 
You can go into the Cartesian backdrop again, behavioralism, identity theory, functionalism, physical reduction. Cartesian dualism, divisibility argument, conceivability argument, Arnold's criticism, Prince of Elizabeth's criticism. So Cartesian dualism, essence and properties, divisibility argument, Leibniz law, X equals Y, if and only if every property of X is a property of Y, mind essence, mind is essentially indivisible, material essence, matter is essentially divisible, so mind cannot equal matter. Conceivability argument, if I conceive of my mind existing without my body, then it's possible for my mind to exist without my body. If I can conceive of my mind existing without my body, so it is possible for my mind to exist without my body. So Nolte's criticism, Descartes assumed that if I can conceive of X without Y, then it's possible for X to exist without Y. Arnold challenged him with the following example, a man ignorant of geometric knowledge can conceive of a right triangle existing without having the Pythagorean property P, the reason why is, poss is because he may grasp that a triangle T has a 90-degree angle but failed to see that it has a Pythagorean property. However, it is impossible for T to exist without P, so it is not true that S can conceive of X without Y. It is possible for X to exist without Y. So Princess Elizabeth's criticism, Descartes maintained that the mind and matter are fundamentally distinct. Princess Elizabeth raised the following worry about causation by showing that the following claims are inconsistent, upward causation, sometimes my body causes my mind to think something, downward causation, sometimes I decide to do something and then my body moves, causal closure, all of my entities of the same type can bear causal relation to one another, dualism, mind and matter are fundamentally distinct types. So in the 20th century, you got wit concedes, Beetle in a box thought experiment, Riles University objection, logical versus methodological behaviorism, mental states as behavior dispositions, problems to behavior dispositions. Wit concedes, the Beetle in a box. If I say of myself that it is only from my own case that I know what the word pain means, must I not say the same of other people too and how I generalize the one case so irresponsibly? Suppose someone had a box with something in it we call it a beetle. No one can look into anyone else's box, and everyone says he knows what a beetle is only by looking at his beetle. Here it would be quite possible for everyone to have something different in his box. One might even imagine such things constantly changing, but suppose the word beetle had a use in these people's language. If so, it would not be used as the name of a thing. The thing in the box has no place in the language game at all, not even as something, for the box might even be empty. No one could divide through by the thing in the box, it cancels out whatever it is. That is to say, if we construe the grammar of the expression of sensation and the model of the object and designation, the object drops out of consciousness as irrelevant. The so either mental state terms name something internal, which is private and inaccessible to others, or they pick up something external and which is public and accessible to others. A mental state term picks out something that internal, which is private and inaccessible to others, then it's possible that the internal experience each of us associates with a mental state term, such as pain, picks out our own case, something different from that of others. As a consequence, it is a principle possible that we do not mean the same thing by the use of mental state terms. If a mental state term picks out something external, which is public and accessible to others, then it's possible for a mental state term to have some stable component of meaning in virtue of which others can communicate with one another. So mental state terms cannot only have private components of meaning in virtue of which their meaning is exhausted. Moreover, mental state terms also have public meaning component. You get Ryles University. Foreigner visiting Oxford or Cambridge for the first time is shown a number of colleges, libraries, playing field, museums, scientific departments, and administrative offices. He then asks, but where is the university? I've seen where the members of the college live, where the registrar works, where the scientists experiments, and the rest, but I've not yet seen the university in which reside and work the members of your university. It is then to be explained to him that the university is not another collateral institution, some ulterior counterpart in the college laboratories and offices which has been seen. The university is just a way in which all that has already seen is organized when they're seen and when their coordination is understood, the university has been seen. His mistake lay in the innocent assumption that it was correct to speak of Christ Church, the Boldean Library, the Ashmole Museum and the university to speak that is as if the university stood for an extra member of the class 
of which these other units are members. He was mistaken allocating the university to the same category to that which the other institutions belong. So it's a category mistake occurs when a predicate is applied to domain for which it is not defined. The quest for the nature of mind is something independent of and over and above the behaviors we engage is like looking for the nature of the university as something independent and over above the various parts in their organization. The quest in the university case rests on a category of mistake. So the quest of mind case rest in a category of mistake. Pretty deep stuff. You didn't mention that, that uh, you know, Ryle's university will be like the people who say that there is no hard problem consciousness. We just work on the easy problems of consciousness. And that in turn will be the answer to the overall question of consciousness. So behavioralism, dualism. When one listens attentively, there is an internal focusing of one's attention and listening. The attention is a function of mind and listening is a function of bodily behavior. Behavioralism, listening attentively, is a unified act not composed of two distinct components involving conscious attentive focus and bodily listening. All that is involved is listening attentively to what everyone is listening to. Behaviorism is the view that mental life is nothing over and above behavior. There are two different kinds of behavioralism. Logical behaviorism maintains that mental states under logical analysis just are behavioral states. Methodological behavior maintains that from a physiological standpoint, behavior is all that matters for the study of the mind. Internal states are not objectively observable, and so it is incorrect to try to deploy them in psychology. Logical behavior and mental states, such as Jones believes that it will rain, so on and so on. Problems of behavior and circularity is a problem for behavior disposition. Putnam super Spartans is a problem for behavioral dispositions. Causation is a problem for behavioralism. Circularity, circularity is a problem for behavioral dispositions. Analysis of mental states in terms of dispositions is successful only if the analysis is non-circular. In the analysis of belief, the notion of intention is shown up, so we don't have a complete analysis of mental states in terms of pure behavior. Is it possible to give a non-circular analysis? And does the circularity even matter then? So Putnam's, this is Hillary Putnam, not Robert Putnam from the capital, social capital. So Putnam super Spartans from Brains and Behavior in 68. Imagine community super Spartans, a community in which the adults have the ability to successfully su uh, suppress all involuntary pain behavior. They may on occasion admit that they feel pain, but always in pleasant, well modulated voices. Even if they are undergoing the agonies of the damned, they do not wince, scream, flinch, sob, grit their teeth, clench their fist, exhibit beads of sweat, or otherwise act like people in pain or people suppressing the unconditional response associated with pain. However, they do feel the pain and dislike it just as we do. They even admit that it takes a great effort of will to behave as they do. It is only that they have what they regard as important ideological reasons for behaving as they do. And they have, through years of training, learned to live up to their own exacting standards. So you have the correct behavior disposition associated with a mental state, only if it is inconceivable that a person in the mental state but fails to display any of the behavior associated. And... Uh, you know, the point of this will be to logically show that it's impossible for the mental state to act to match the behavior of this position. Behavior seems to be the effect on the will as a consequence. Um, if our behavior is all that our mental life amounts to, it will be hard to make sense of claims such as the following. So you have identity theory, type, and token, Jackson Mary's thought experience, Kripke's argument against type identity theory. Putnam's argument against type identity theory. Identity theory is the view that mental states are nothing over and above brain processes. Pain is just uh, some sort of stimulation. No one takes seriously the idea that we have discovered exactly what brain states correlate with which mental states. So the example above is just an equation of sorts that is used to think about the view propounded by identity theory. The is involved is one of strict numerical identity. So there's two kinds of identity, type and token. Type identity theory maintains that each mental state type is identical to some brain state type. Token identity theory maintains that each mental state token is identical to some 
token physical state. So Jackson's married thought experience. Mary is a brilliant scientist who is, for whatever reasons, forced to investigate the world from a black and white room via black and white television monitor. She specializes in neurophysiology of vision and acquires that I suppose all the physical information that is to obtain about what goes on when we see ripe tomatoes or the sky and use terms like red, blue, and so on. She discovers, for example, just which wavelengths combinations from the sky stimulate the retina and exactly how this produces via the ventral nervous system that construction of the vocal cords and expulsion of air from the lungs that results in the uttering of the sentence, the sky is blue. What will happen when Mary is released from her black and white room or is given a color television monitor? Will she learn anything or not? It seems just obvious that she will learn something about the world and our visual experience of it, but then is inescapable that her previous knowledge was incomplete. She had all the physical information, ergo, there's more to have than that, and physicalism is false. So, you know, the simple version, Mary knows all the physical facts. Mary does not know all the facts, so the physical facts do not exhaust all of the facts. You know, she hasn't actually seen red, even though she knows all about it. General deduction version, there are truths about consciousness that are not deducible from physical truths. If there are truths about consciousness that are not deducible from physical truths, then physicalism is false. So physicalism is false. One of the arguments I basically gave to JF. Kripke's argument against type identity theory if it is conceivable for P to exist without Q, then there is no way in which the conception of P without Q can be confused with something else than it's possible for P to exist without Q. If it is conceivable that someone is in pain and that C5 or stimulation is not occurring, and there is no way in which the conception of the phenomenology of pain can be confused with some other state, so it is possible for pain to exist without C5 or stimulation. Pain equals C5 or firing only if it's necessary that pain so pain is not the same thing as the physical stimulation. In Putnam's argument against type identity theory, mental states are multiple, multiply realizable. They can occur in both humans and non-human animals, and they are also theoretically possible in beings that are not fundamentally carbon-based. If pain equals uh, the firing, then any creature that fails to have C fibers cannot be in pain. So since mental states of pain are multiply realizable, capable of being had by both humans, dogs, and creatures whose existence we do not yet know in terms of the matter that constitutes them. Mental states are not the type identical with any specific human brain structure. And functionalism, fundamentals, problem mental holism, problem inverted spectra, Chinese nation argument, and the Chinese room argument. Foundations of functionalism. Functionalism maintains that the essence of mental states, such as being in pain, having a desire, or holding a belief is the functional role that play in the cognitive system, the function focus on functionalism and not on the matter of the substance that realizes the function. Functionalists try to define mental states in terms of the causal relations that they bear to inputs, outputs, and other mental states. Example, pain is the state that tends to be caused by bodily injury, produce the belief that something is wrong with the body and the desire to be out of that state, to produce anxiety in the absence of any stronger conflicting desires to cause wincing and moaning. Functionalism is not the same as behavioralism because while behavioralism makes no inference, reference to internal mental states, functionalism explicitly does. Functionalism is not open to the circularity problem that behaviorism faced because functionalism can use Ramsey's sentence to avoid circularity. Consider the definition of pain above. You can see that in mathematical notation. The problem of mental holism, the objection from mental hol holism holds that functionalism makes it very hard for two distinct individuals of the same species and two individuals of different species to share the same mental states. Between persons versions, John and Jim both believe that uh, the A's will win the pennant, but that and a few other beliefs are the only ones that they have in common. So given that the little of their psychology is in common, it cannot be that the beliefs have some functional role, so they don't have the same belief. Cross species varies. Mental holism cuts against the idea that functionalism can really capture the multiple realizability of mental states in the right way. Problem of inverted spectra, functionalism about the qualitative aspect of seeing a color is true only if it is impossible for there to be two individuals with identical functional roles but distinct qualitative characters. It is conceivable that two individuals exist with inverted spectra where one sees blue and the other sees yellow, where one sees red and the other sees green. If it is conceivable that P, then it is possible that P. So it is possible that inverted spectra exists. 
So functionalism about the qualitative aspect of seeing color is false. Functionalism cannot capture the qualitative aspect of experience. And the Chinese nation argument. Suppose we convert the government of China to functionalism and we convince its officials that it would enormously enhance their international prestige to realize a human mind for an hour. We provide each of the billion people of China with a specially designed two-way radio that connects them with the appropriate way to the other persons the artificial body mentioned in the previous example. We replace the little men with a radio transmitter and receiver connected to the input and output neurons instead of a bulletin board rearranged to have letters displayed in a series of satellites placed so that they can be seen from anywhere in China. Would such a system instantiate a mind? You know, if everyone from China is uh, connected to this two-way radio conducting this experiment at the same time, would all of these you know, easy problems of consciousness make up to solve the hard problem? Functionalism maintains that mental states are defined by their functional role and not by the material that realizes the role. And it's true only if any material that does not realize the role actually instantiates the state. It's possible for the Chinese nation to instantiate the role of a particular mental state or a set of mental states for about an hour. However, the impulse plausible that the Chinese nation actually instantiates the particular mental state or set of mental states for the hour envisioned, so functionalism is false. And the same, similar to the Chinese room argument, imagine a bunch of computer programs are written in a program that enable computers to stimulate the understanding of Chinese. So for example, if the computer is given a question in Chinese, it will match the question against its memory or database and produce appropriate answers to the questions in Chinese. Suppose for the sake of argument, the computer's answers are as good as those of a native Chinese speaker. Now then, does the computer on the basis of this understand Chinese? Does it literally understand Chinese in the way that Chinese speakers understand Chinese? So part two, imagine that you're locked in a room. In this room, there are several baskets full of Chinese symbols. Imagine that you, like me, do not understand a word of Chinese, but you are given a rule book in English for manipulating these Chinese symbols. The rules specify the manipulations of the symbols purely formally in terms of their syntax not the semantics, so the rule might say take a squiggle squiggle sign out of basket number one and put it in the, next to the squaggle squaggle sign in the basket number two. Now suppose that some of the other Chinese symbols are passed into the room and that you are given further rules for passing back Chinese symbols out of the room. Suppose that unknown to you, the symbols passed into the room are called questions by the people outside the room and the symbols you pass back out of the room are called answers to questions. Suppose furthermore that the programmers are so good at designing the programs and that you are so good at manipulating the symbols that very soon your answers are indistinguishable from those of native, native Chinese speakers. Therefore, you are locked in your room shuffling your Chinese symbols with respect to incoming Chinese symbols. So strong artificial intelligence, a suitably programmed computer can understand natural language and actually have other mental capacities similar to humans. If strong AA is true, then there is a program for Chinese such that any computing system runs that program, that system thereby comes to understand Chinese. A person could run a program for Chinese without thereby coming to understand Chinese. Therefore, strong AI is false. So computer programs are completely defined by the formal syntactic structures. Manipulating syntax is not efficient for generating semantic understanding. Minds have semantic capacities, so computers cannot give rise to minds. Simulating a mind is not equivalent to duplicating a mind. Physical reductionism, fundamentals of physical reductionism, Kim's argument for causal exclusion, Davidson Fodor argument against reductionism. Reductionism is the general attempt to reduce the phenomenon described in one vocabulary to the language of another vocabulary. Typically, one claims that the reduced vocabulary is not fundamental. Physical reduction is the philosophy of mind, is the view that mental life can be completely understood in terms of physical entities and relations, physical supervenience. No two possible worlds can be identical in their physical properties and be different in their mental or social properties. If A supervenes on B, then A can be reduced to B. Supervenience, Lewis's example, a dot matrix picture has global properties. It is, if it is symmetrical, it is cluttered and whatnot, and yet all there is to the picture and dots and non-dots at each point in the matrix, the global properties are nothing but patterns in the dots. They supervene, no two pictures could differ in their global properties without differing somewhere in whether there is or isn't a dot. It's reduction Lewis account. So you have mental state and the function, and therefore the mental state equals the function. So Kim's argument from causal inclusion, following four claims appear to be inconsistent. Mental properties have causal powers. Mental properties supervene on physical properties. Every physical effect has a sufficient physical cause. 
if a property E has a sufficient cause C, then no other property C distinct from C can be the cause of E. What calls of work do mental properties do? And Fodor's argument against reductionism from the characters of the law, law of psychology involves exceptions. Laws of physics do not involve exceptions. So the laws of psychology cannot be reduced to the laws of physics. Psychological law of the agent A desires D and M is a means to D. Then all else being equal, A ought to do M. You know, physical law like E equals MC squared. These laws don't have the same characters. So reduction is impossible. Okay, so that was pretty intense. A lot of philosophy of mind. That was, uh, you know, some deep philosophy. I'd seen a lot of that before. So in St. Hermit, you're still here. Hope you're gaining from this. Take a quick break and take a drink. In yeah, these deeper issues... We spend time arguing about social sciences and people, and, and you know, we have to answer these deeper questions are really at the heart of it. Phenomenology, you know, that, that uh, we, uh, I said that a few times, I'm going to put it up again. The science of phenomena is distinct from that of the nature of being, an approach that concentrates on the study of consciousness and the objects of direct experiences. Okay, so keep moving on. I'm going to do this one on language acquisition. Can we see now that uh, you know consciousness and language are related? What do we understand of language? You know, Chomsky. How do we acquire language, which is going to be similar to how, how do we acquire thought? Do we think in the language? Do we think in language? Do we think in symbols? Is there universal grammar like Chomsky? Capacity to learn language is deeply ingrained in us as a species, just like the capacity to walk, to grasp objects, to recognize faces. We don't find any serious difference in children growing up in congested urban slums and isolated mountain villages or in privileged suburban villas. We are designed to walk. That we are taught to walk is impossible, and pretty much the same is true of language. Nobody is taught language. In fact, you can't prevent a child from learning it. Chomsky. First language, the language that an individual learns first native language or mother tongue. So how do children acquire such a complex system so quickly and effortlessly? Is there a conscious effort by the child to learn the language? Does correcting children's errors help? So the theories on first language acquisition, behaviorism, nativism, cognitive approach, interaction approach. Behavioralism, Skinner. Language learning is a kind of behavior similar to other human behavior. Language is learned in much the same way as anything else is learned. Skinner, language behavior is the production of correct responses to stimuli through reinforcement. Language learning is the result of imitation, word-for-word -word repetition, practice, repetitive manipulation of form, feedback on success, positive reinforcement, and habit formation, the quality and quantity of the language that the child hears, as well as the consistency of the reinforcement offered by others as the environment, would shape the child's language behavior because the behaviorists are universal across all aspects of learning. That's why I wanted to go straight into linguistics and language acquisition. Stimulus organism response, input learner imitation, four steps for a child to acquire his or her first language, imitation, reinforcement, positive and negative, repetition, and habituation, good and bad habits. Criticism is a behaviorism overemphasis on external factors like a parent's to provide a model of imitation, ignore the internal factor, the role of learner himself in the language learning process, overemphasis on the role of imitation, and children do not use language cre cre creatively, uh, do use language creatively, not just repeat what they've learned. Nativism, Chomsky, 59, it's all in your mind. We are all born with language activision acquisition device and access to universal grammar. 
Chomsky, children are biologically programmed for language and language develops in the child in just the same way that other biological functions develop. The environment makes only a basic contribution that is the availability of people who speak to the child. Therefore, the child's biological endowment will do the rest. Children are born with specific innate ability to discover for themselves the underlying rule of a language system on the basis of the samples a natural language they are exposed to. Chomsky's arguments against behavioralism. Chomsky argues that behaviorism cannot provide sufficient explanation for children's language acquisitions for the following reason. Children come to know more about the structure of the language than they could be expected to learn on the basis of the samples of language they hear. The language children are exposed to includes false starts and complete sentences and slips of the tongue, and yet they learn to distinguish between grammatical and ungrammatical sentences. Children are by no means systematically corrected or instructed on language by parents. So Chomsky says innate, universal grammar is the term Chomsky gives for the abstract principle that comprises the child's innate knowledge of a language and that guide language acquisition. So language acquisition design, the imaginary black wax existing somewhere in the brain or the soul. So the language acquisition device contains the principles which are universal to all human languages, universal grammar, for it to work, children need access only to samples of natural language, which serve as a trigger to activate the device. Once the language acquisition device is activated, children are able to discover the structure of the language to be learned by matching the innate knowledge of the basic grammatical principles to the structures of the particular language in the environment. Evidence to support Chomsky's innate position, virtually all children successfully learn their native language at a time in life where they would not be expected to learn anything else so complicated. Language is separate from other aspects of cognitive development and may be located in a different module of the brain. The language children are exposed to does not contain examples of all the linguistic rules and patterns. Animals cannot learn to manipulate symbol system as complicated as the natural language of a three or four year old child. Children require grammatical rules without getting explicit instruction. Therefore, children acquisition of grammatical rules is probably guided by principle of innate universal grammar, which could apply to all languages. So his criticisms of nativism, the nativist and natives place too much emphasis on the final state, the linguistic competence of adult native speakers, but not enough on the developmental aspects of language acquisition. Language acquisition, an example of children's ability to learn from experience. What children need to know is essentially available in the language they're exposed to. Criticism is nativism. Developmental psychiatrists attribute more importance to the environment to the innatus, though they also recognize a powerful learning mechanism of the human brain. They see language acquisition as similar to and influenced by the acquisition of other kinds of skill and knowledge rather than something that is largely independent of the child's experience and cognitive development. So you have the cognitive approach by Piaget, 52. Language learning is part of a child's cognitive development. Children's language development relies on their understanding of the world or cognition. For Piaget, language is dependent upon the and springs from cognitive development. As children's cognitive development determines their language development, the use of words is bigger and more depends on children's understanding of the concepts they represent. Argue that the developing cognitive understanding is built on the interaction between the child and things which can be observed, touched, and manipulated. For him, language was one of a number of symbols systems developed in childhood rather than a separate module of the mind. Language could be used to represent knowledge that children have acquired through physical interaction with the environment. So you got famous PJ's four different stages. Sensory motory stage. During the early stages, infants are only aware of what is immediately in front of them because they don't yet know how things react. They're constantly experimenting with activities such as shaking or throwing things putting things in their mouths and learning about the world through trial and error. At about seven to nine months, infants realize, begin to realize that if an object exists, even if it can no longer be seen, this important milestone known as object performance, permanence is a sign that memory is developing. After infants start crawling, standing, and walking, their increased physical mobility leads to increased cognitive development. Near the end of the sensory motor stage, infants reach another important milestone. Early language development is a sign that they're developing more some symbolic abilities. In the pre-operational stage, during this stage, young children are to think about things symbolically. Their language use becomes more mature. They also develop memory and imagination, which allows them to understand the difference between past and future, engage and make believe. But their thinking is based on intuition, still not completely logical. They cannot yet grasp more complex concepts such as cause and effect, time and comparison. 
concrete operational stage. At this stage, elementary age and pre-adolescent children demonstrate logical concrete reasoning. Children's thinking becomes less exocentric and they are increasingly aware of external events. They begin to realize that one's own thoughts and feelings are unique and may not be shared by others or may not even be part of reality. Children also develop operational thinking, the ability to perform reversible mental actions. During this stage, however, most children still cannot tackle a problem with several variables in a systematic way. During the formal operation stage, adolescents who reach the support stage of intellectual development are able to logically use symbols related to abstract concepts such as algebra and science. They can think about multiple variables in systematic ways, formulate hypotheses, and consider possibilities. They also can ponder abstract relationships and concepts such as justice. And they have the interactionist approach, focus on interaction. Interactionist theories are concerned with the interplay between environmental and biological factors in the process of acquiring language. You got Bruner, interactionist argues parents provide their children language acquisition support. The language acquisition support system is a collection of strategies that parents employ to facilitate their learning's ac their child children's acquisition of language. One of these strategies is scaffolding the deliberate use of language at a level that is slightly beyond what children can comprehend. Social cultural theory of human mental processing. Uh, Vygotsky argues that language develops primarily from social interaction, zone of proximal development a level that the child is able to do when there's support from interaction with more advanced interlocu interlocutor. That is a supportive interactive environment enables children to advance to a higher level of knowledge and performance that he would be able to do independently. He observed the importance of conversations which children have with adults and with other children and saw this conversation, the origins of both language and thought. Criticisms of interaction theories suggests that parents rarely offer their children's direct feedback on the appropriateness of their grammar, linguistic and social practice, very widely across cultures. Some cultures do not use anything like the practice described by interaction, and yet their children still learn a language at a similar rate to Western children. So there you have it. A lot to get through, a lot to understand, you know, trying to put forward some research. So thank you, you're still here, Hermit. Yeah, there's a lot of information here. You got some more to get through. Cover some more consciousness. Consciousness. Objective science of consciousness possible. Minority of contemporary psychologists think not since consciousness cannot be observed directly. Same problem as a behavioralist. Some think it is possible. Consciousness is a biological feature of human and certain animal brains. It is caused by neurobiological processes and a much part of the natural biological order as any other biological features such as photosynthesis, digestion, or mitos mitosis. So what are the brain mechanisms that uh, generate consciousness? So just the neural network. You have the default mode network, which is active when people are not engaged in the eternal environment, some called the seat of the self. When is consciousness helpful? What does it do? What does it add? So man le learning, con concentration is required when learning something that only becomes automatic after learn, making judgment, people thinking clearly about alternatives and choices, troubleshooting, conscious mental processes are needed in dealing with novel situations that automatic responses cannot handle. And you deal with a lot with what is sense perception. What happens unconsciously? What's the difference between something being unconsciously done versus being consciously done? So unconscious thought processes, early interest in Europe in the 1830s and 40s, 20th century interest spurred by the work of Freud and Jung, another surge of interest in the 1980s to present caused by the advent of brain scanning technique which allowed for speculation about what processes were occurring outside conscious attention. The result, contemporary psychologists working on unconscious mind distinguish multiple unconscious processes rather than an unconscious. Five definitions of unconscious mental processes. Mental activities is unconscious if people are unaware of it. Something is unconscious if it happens without effort. An unconscious action is that which one is unintended. An unconscious mental pro process is 
autonomous and run by itself without conscious attention. A behavior is unconscious if it resists conscious control. It's unconscious learning. 67 experiments showing subject letter strings that followed a hidden rule. Subjects could detect whether the new strings fit the rule without being able to specify what the rule is. Called this intuition, grasping something, knowing something without knowing how we know it. Um, so saying this suggests the pattern recognition precedes consciousness, articula articulation and grasp of the structure of the pattern recognized. These unconscious learning processes seem to have arrived before the conscious ones. Sophisticated unconscious perceptual and cognitive functions preceded its emergence by considerable margin. So brain scan experiments show this process of moving from unconscious to conscious knowledge automatically. These brain states were called output maps as they got larger, subject became conscious of what they had earlier detected unconsciously, resulting in explicit knowledge. As they moved to automatically, the brain area got progressively smaller so that when the task was fully learned and automatically a small area of the cortex was active. What this may mean about how the brain works, consider these situation problem solving situation. New problem requires lots of neural engagement, but as the problem gets gradually solved, less and less neurons are required. So you have two modes of thought, serial sequential processing and parallel processing. So Nieser suggested sequential corresponds to what uh, Bruner called analytical thinking, whereas parallel corresponds to what he termed intuitive thinking. Analytical thinking, stepwise thinking, where all steps are subject to conscious attention and control according to the procedures that are well understood and applied explicitly, good for active planning, and this is consistent with the fact that the anterior Singular gyrus and prefrontal cortex thought to be involved in executive control lights up when people are engaged in this kind of thinking. Intuitive thinking seems to involve maneuvers based seemingly on implicit perception of the total problem. The thinker arrives at the answer with little, if any, awareness of the process by which he reached it. Brain scan show no activation in the executive control parts of the brain. The explanation so far given is that too much is going on at once for a top-down manager or executive control of disparate process to allow them to move forward most efficiently. Trying to focus on any one of the processes blocks the function of the others to some degree. Two kinds of thinking seem to go well with the two kinds of psychological research, parallel with observational, sequential with experimental. The two powers of science reflect the two modes of human thinking. The two modes, again, uh, Reichel discovered the two distinct processes pathways in the brain using brain scanning techniques, one pathway active during conscious learning, the other active during automatic unconscious processing. Epstein associates the common distinctness between heart and head. Distinction surfaced again with Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. He posits system one is fast, intuitive, and emotional, and system two that is slow, more deliberate, and more logical. Additional evidence for the existence of the two separate processes and found in certain cases of a prosop Pagnosia, face blindness caused by brain damage, someone who is unable to detect familiar faces, consciously is nonetheless able to distinguish, detect them unconsciously as evidenced by emotional response to familiar faces. The reverse has been found in some of these brain damaged subjects. Another example involves spirit conditioning, taught to associate a tone with an electric saw shock. Normally you get two results. Subject remembers the connection, knows the tone precedes the shock, and subject shows an emotional response to the tone. These responses can become doubly disassociated, as in the face blindness case, where there's either damage to the amygdala removes the emotional process, or to the hippocampus removes the conscious response. Sleep. In the 20th century, the rapid eye movement cycle was discovered. Golden age of sleep research. Azarinsky, pioneer of sleep at University of Chicago, discovered rapid eye movement. Rapid eye movement is very rapid. Eight movements back and forth per second coincides with EG measurements had established in the 1930s as an active alert phase in brain activity during sleep. That is the EG brain pattern is the same as when a person is awake and active. Rapid eye movement sleep is indicated by multiple criteria, not only rapid eye movement, the latter can and does subside with other indicators like the EEG pattern continues. Waking, sleeping subject at these times reveals the same thing. They're dreaming 70 to 80% of the time. Psychologists initially discounted talk of connection between REM sleep and dreaming until it was discovered that cats also experience REM sleep. And Jovin noticed that in the same periods of REM sleep, cats showed biological signs similar to those of a waking animal. This bit with EEG results in human. This was initiated by the Golden Age of Sleep Research. Also happening in animals, it must be real. REM sleep has been shown to be generic, generally common in mammals. 
So you have your stages of sleep, regular 90 to 100 minute cycles repeated three or four times each night. Non-REM sleep comes in one in four stages, starting with the fifth stage, waking but drowsy, followed by a sixth stage REM sleep. Stage one, onset of sleep, disappearance of alpha waves and cut off of the attention to the environment. Um, stage two, non-REM with two EEG patterns, sleep spindles and K-complexes. Stages three and four, non-REM with increasing presence of delta EEG patterns called slow wave sleep and delta sleep is the second hardest to awaken someone from that stage of sleep. The hardest being the REM sleep, then stage five, REM sleep. After the first cycle, sleeper alternates between two and five for the rest of the night. So why do we sleep? Scientists still aren't sure. Proposals, advantage for staying hidden uh, when vulnerable at night, most vulnerable creatures adapt either to day or night, but not both, may help body recover from the streams of activity, but sleep is not rest for the brain, which works no less actively in sleep than when awake, just differently active, may be caused by chemical and bloodstream that makes us sleepy. Uh, 1913 showed that the transfusing blood from a sleeping animal to a waking one caused the latter to fall asleep. Experimental studies 2008 to, um, showed that sleep might aid learning and memory by deleting unused connections. To normal sleep, seven to nine hours, average 7.2. Short 15 minute naps every few hours can compensate for lack of sleep. Dreaming, prefrontal cortex. Some dreams could occur in non-REM sleep, and these are very different from REM sleep dream. Weird stories are almost always REM sleep dreams. Fragments of normal thought are almost always non-REM sleep dreams. So in general, REM dreams are like narrative, whereas non-REM dreams seem like ordinary thinking. So you have dream recallers and non-recallers. The difference is explained by the fact that people who do not remember dreams wake up more slowly than people who do remember another correlation. Non-recallers show a large electrical shift in brain activity between dreaming and being awake, whereas recallers do not show such dramatic shift in EEG readings. Their readings gradually change, suggesting a continuity of brain activities as transition to wakefulness is achieved. Eye and body movements related to dreams. Most studies show no relation between eye movements and sleep while dreaming and the content of the dreams while falling asleep. Most people experience some monoclonic contractions or sleep. Um, Myoclonus, there's shock-like contractions of muscles producing sudden movements. So your meaningful dreams contain important insight into emotional or psychological problems. You got warning dreams point to dangerous situations in the future. Guilt and worry dreams express concern about past and present events. Inspirational dreams set goals or ideals to attain. Post-traumatic dreams contain flashbacks to stressful events. Problem-solving dreams present solutions to difficulties. So lack of sleep, we say about 45 hours after four days, um, about too much, typical maximum, maybe eight days um, after 100 hours was hallucinating. Maximum record known, 260 hours. Couldn't count backwards, lost the mental activity. So you have mental lapsing, boring tasks, performing drops, hard tasks, no effort, no effect, insomnia, legitimate condition in some people. Um, you have to go to sleep lab to coordinate that mistaken beliefs of self-reporting, insomniacs, people who think they have insomnia but who sleep as much as normal persons. So you show this is based on confusion. The only difference with these people and normals is that they wake up more times in the night. Daily rhythm and Sunday night insomnia, the circadian rhythm, 24 hours. Body clock could be 25 hours. Result, easy to shift to getting up and going to bed later, but very hard to shift to getting up and going to bed earlier. Solutions for insomnia, going to bed at 3 a.m. or 5 a.m. or set sleep rhythms to get going to bed two hours later and successive nights until going to bed at the normal time. Other evidence is a circadian versus national bo body rhythm problem. Workers find it easy to go from a day shift to an evening shift to a night shift and then back to a day shift, but extremely hard to do the reverse. Melatonin sleep produced by the perineal gland. Melatonin levels increase mid-evening. Sleep phenomenon, sleepwalking sleep talking, hypnagogic state, um, hypnopompic state, unusual states involved in the process of waking, usually a state of disorientation, but can involve apparent intelligent directed actions. Some people have wakened from sleep, 
performed a complex tax and gone back to sleep, only remember nothing of the episode the next day. Sleep disorders, insomnia, hypersomnias, narcolepsy, circadian rhythm, sleep wake disorders, parasomnias, sleep related movement disorders, REM sleep disorder, sleep paralysis, cataplexy, somnomania, even sleep disorders, more at sleep apnea, nightmares, night terrors, and finally hypnosis. You know, Mesmer produced uh, procedures different than modern techniques. Mesmer attributes effects of his procedures to animal magnetism, mysterious energy fields surrounding living things. Um, power suggestion. Hypnosis, who could be hypnosis, he, he, who could be hypnotized. Yeah. Post-hypnotic suggestion, post-hypnotic amnesia, disassociative state, connections to memory. Can you hypnotize someone and make them do uh, ridiculous things? Meditation, wide variety of techniques for calming and focusing the mind. These techniques were highly developed in Eastern cultures such as India, China, Japan, where meditation was taught in connection with Buddhism and Hinduism, quieting the mind. What many forms of meditation have in common is quieting the normal thought process, normally talk to ourselves all the time. In meditation, one allows language to flow on, but without engaging the mind. This result is a state of consciousness unusual for Westerners. Difficult at first, the mind suddenly sees itself as a prisoner. It struggles, resents, tears loose to do what is always done to dream, to fancy, to race aimlessly like a squirrel into a cage, to hold conversations with itself, anything to avoid the reality of here. The mind becomes devious and cunning. It thinks and pretends to itself that it is not thinking, and suddenly it breaks out of the warm, satisfying fancy, and the meditation is shattered, and then the mind sees itself and realizes that it is simply sit and be here is perhaps the hardest thing in the world. Techniques focus on breathing, on breathing a special rhythmic way, chanting a mantra. What's it like to be in a meditative state? Hard to describe. Since nonverbal state of mind, experienced meditators report freedom from attachment to the outside world or the normal thought process. Some say a screen is lifted and reality is perceived directly without an intervening thought process. Some call it countless awareness or choiceless awareness. Some are profound experiences, other merely ordinary states of relaxation. Research, you know, the Beatles, Maharishi, Maharishi Yogi. I'll actually show you some of that research I, um, in the, not tonight, maybe the next time I do this. Stress, mindfulness, the newer form of meditation promoted by psychologists to treat chronic pain, just involve conscious direction of awareness combined with acceptance of what is just before the mind, uh, kindness, non judgmental awareness of moment to moment experience effects. Much is claimed for the result of using this technique, including countering age related cognitive decline, reduction of post traumatic stress symptoms, reducing relapse of depressive by half. Reduction anxiety, reduced depression, increased positive emotional experience, reduced chronic insomnia. Evidence studies do not support any of these claims except modern improvements with chronic anxiety, depression, and pain conditions. No evidence to support any of the other claims' effects. And you have psychoactive drugs. Drugs that affect states of consciousness are called psychoactive drugs. Um, the ability to cross blood brain barrier, alter brain chemistry at the level of individual brain cells act on neurotransmitters, affect the, uh, depends on dosage. Um, in prior experience, could uh, sensitize individuals to future exposures, leading to a larger, a larger reaction when the same drug is taken again, or smaller. Your dangers, toxic uh, dose, effective dose. You got depressants, hypnotics, stimulants, opiates, solutions, marijuana. Marijuana drug is in a class by itself and does not resemble any other drug in its effect. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hermit. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, glad to be doing this. Um, even just for myself, I'm, I'm glad that there's other people. Hopefully we could develop an intellectual community. Um, chapter four of this. This one's got 90 slides. This is my last slideshow for tonight, so about two hours, and we'll see if I have energy um, to do any of the papers. Ancient wisdom, materialism, atom sensation, Democritus, Lucretius, body and soul, Plato, 
soul is the form of the body, Aristotle. You know, always back to the ancient times. A lot of these ideas were discussed in ancient times. Everything that exists is material, therefore minds are not spiritual in any sense. You know, the same things today the ancients had thought of, although we have different and possibly better knowledge now. Sensation is shown to be dependent on states of the body, thus the taste of something may be affected by sickness. Sensations and other mental phenomena are simply atoms in motion. Mental abilities vary with physical conditions. Suggest minds are simply kinds of conditions of bodies. So you got Plato, dualist, soul is intrinsically pure, the body is associated with misleading and evil passions and appetites, soul is intrinsically immortal, because where the body is intrinsically mortal. Soul develops. You got Aristotle, principle of life in all living things. So the soul conceived such as a principle must exist in plants and all animals. It is not separable from the body, but rather is the form or manner of operation of a living thing. He's got his different forms, the vegetative soul, the animal soul, and the rational soul. You got Hindu, classical Hindu beliefs, outer empirical self and the inner self, strict monism, Shankara, Charya, Qualified monism, Ramanujacharya. You know, like the my bodies, the impersonalists and the personalists. Eastern ideas about the body, soul, mind are often colored by religious concerns. According to some thinkers, the soul's true self is identified with God. When God is conceived pantheonistically, the self is thus identical with reality itself. They're continuing puzzles about the relationship of that which is more mind like or spiritual to that which is more physical the outer empirical self and the inner self. The true self is buried deep within us and discovering it requires remarkable effort. It is not identical with either the physical or psychological as ordinarily conceived. The object of our search for the self is the great unchangeable self, which is without beginning or end and without qualities. The wise seek the true self in what is eternal and are undistracted by the senses of ordinary fears and hopes. Uh, Shankaracharya, strict monism, the outer empirical self and all other empirical entities are mere illusion. The one reality of God, Brahman, and you are that. There is no plurality. Reality is one unchanging eternity. Reality is not distinct from God, and God is one, so reality is one. The qualified monism, Ramanuja, the outer empirical self, and my true self reflect two distinct aspects within the single God. The strict monism is not quite correct. In text, you are that. Uh, tatvam asi, the relationship of the constituents' parts is not meant to convey the idea of an absolute unity of an undifferentiated substance. The word that refers to God as omniscient. The word you, which stands in relation to that, conveys the idea of God insofar as the body consists of the individual souls connected to the non intelligent matter. I'm pretty sure this is how Lord Chaitanya and the Hare Krishna movement is in line with uh, qualified monism over Manujacharya. So modern views on uh, mind and body, you know, Descartes, mixture of body and soul, the Conway, idealist monism, parallelism, Spinoza, and Leibniz. So 16th century, European philosophers turned their attention to the nature of mind and consciousness and its relationship to the body. The interest was partly the result of scientific achievements of the time. Engineers and clockmakers were capable of crafting complex and sophisticated machines which were self-regulating. Biologists and anatomists began to think of the human body as a sophisticated, soft machine. Questions then naturally emerged about how human minds relate to our bodily machinery. The resulting body theories defined the nature of the debate for centuries to come. So more of Descartes. The mental is completely distinct from the physical, in line with Plato. What distinguishes the physical is that it can be measured, weighed, and generally treated mathematically, whereas the mental cannot be treated in those ways. Mind is not divisible, does not have parts, as the material obviously does. Brain mediates between the mind and the body. So the soul or mind is not dispersed throughout the body, but works through the brain. We we'll see different conceptions of this concept of this Descartes. 
the body affects the mind through the brain naturally produces bodily actions which are conductive to survival descartes does not explain how completely non-physical thing the mind could have any effect on any part of any physical thing the problem of the mind body interaction so conway body and soul are originally in their first substance one and the same thing like descartes to hold the body and soul are entirely different things the body being more dead machine completely failed to explain how the body and soul can interact um so that's Conway's mixture of the two. So you have Spinoza and Leibniz, the idealistic monism, parallelism. So the Cartesian assumptions of the apparent interaction of the body and soul is a complete mystery. Those assumptions must be altered. Spinoza argues the entire universe is soul like Leibniz. Leibniz that the body and soul do not interact, but physical and mental events are lined up in parallel series pre established by God, hence the calculus. Spinoza's monistic idealism identifies. All that exists with God, God and nature, two aspects of the one thing. There's no distinct physical substance apart from God. According to Leibniz, the activities of souls are to be explained in terms of final causes, purposes, intentions, while the activities of bodies are explained mechanically or in terms of efficient causes, the causal interactions described in physics and chemistry, for example. There's no interaction between mind and body. Or physical and mental events occur in order relation to each other. 20th century, illogical behaviorism, mind body identity, and eliminated materialism, and churchland, functionalism. So, intense focus on the philosophy of mind in the 20th and 21st century, brain research and developments in psychology have provoked philosophical commentary and research into artificial intelligence. Philosophers employed careful analysis and thought experiences to explore concepts of mind, belief, intention, and the like. Some have defined that. Some have denied that the findings of neurologists and psychologists illuminate the nature of mind. Others have put to some detailed result of brain on or AI research into the context of old debates about the relationship of the mental to the physical. So logical behaviorism, expressions referring to what is mental, such as he thought about his brother, belong to different logical categories than expressions referring to physical objects and occurrences. Once that fact is understood, the mystery of the mind and its interactions with the body disappear as does materialism. Minds are not entities at all, either spatial or non-spatial. They are a different logical category than bodies. The concept of mind is the concept of various complex behaviors or dispositions to behave or persons is not the concept of a distinct kind or thing. It follows that mind cannot be reduced to brain activity or the mechanical activities of bodies. So mind-brain identity in the eliminative materialism, smart and churchland, some philosophers hold that mental events are identical with brain events. These views are usually reductionist in sense that mental events are reduced to physical events. Others argue that mentalistic concepts, thinks, imagine, fear, and so forth should be entirely eliminated from scientific descriptions of the world. So Smart argue that just as a nation is nothing over and above the citizens that make it up, so the mind is nothing over and above the particular neuronal events that make it up, minds are reducible to bodies like nations are reducible to citizens, descriptions of mental events may nonetheless differ logically from descriptions of physical events. For example, a thought can be described as clever, whereas it sounds logically odd to describe a brain event as clever. Analogously, a nation could have a trade deficit, where an individual within a nation cannot have a trade deficit. Churchill argues that folk psychology is defective and should be abandoned. So folk psychology is a familiar set of concepts such like desire and the explanatory strategies that we use every day to describe and explain ourselves to others. Folk psychology cannot be refined or improved in the way genuine scientific theories can. Folk psychology is helpless in the face of abnormal behavior produced by damaged brains. Instead of looking for reductions of the mental to the physical, we should give up mentalistic or fake or folk psychological descriptions completely and replace them with descriptions of brain states. Eliminativism is motivated in large part by the quest for the uni unity of science. All explanations are descriptions of the world should ultimately be part of something like physics, a single comprehensive science. So functionalism, folk psychology describes the mental functionality to say, for example, that someone is seeing a green light is to say that they will function in a certain way. For example, they will step on the gas pedal in a certain situation is not to say anything about specific states or activities of particular physical structures such as the brain. Thoughts and other mental states are identified in terms of functional role. Different functions equal different thoughts. Since thoughts can be realized in many physical different kinds of things, humans 
mammals, hypothetical, there could be no identity between a mental state and a specific physical state. Physically different things can have the same thought. It is a confusion to try to reduce the mental to the physical. Such reductions can true mental states as particular things rather than the functional roles. It is likewise a mistake to try to eliminate folk psychology. We need to be able to say what a human and a bat have in common when they both have the thought that there is something in the way that needs to be avoided. What they have in common is not anything physical, but being the same functional defined state. A functional state is defined in terms of inputs, processes, and outputs. So intentionality, mark of the mental and kinds of intentional psychology, be more Daniel Dennett. Distinction between mind and body may be made in terms of a property which minds have that bodies lack, namely intentionality. The idea of intentionality was explored especially by the psychologist and philosopher uh, Brentano. It figures cru crucially in most contemporary discussions in the philosophy of mind. So intentionality is the mark of the mental. Brentano, mental phenomena are always about something or directed upon something. Even when I'm thinking about or waiting or fearing something does not exist, such as a unicorn, my thought is still directed upon an intentionally inexistent object, merely physical objects or events, or the other hand, on the other hand, lack such aboutness. Thus, what distinguishes the mental from the physical is intentionality. So Dennett, three kinds of intentional psychology. We can distinguish three kinds of levels of intentional psychology, folk psychology, intentional systems theory, and subpersonal cognitive theory. First is a mixture of abstract and concrete features and often works well but lacks scientific status. The second is purely abstract. The third involves explanations of human behavior in terms of actual features of the brain or nervous system. Folk psychology is an abstract way of describing, explaining people, which works well generally and which should neither be eliminated nor reduced to physics. Folk psychology is abstract, requires conceptual knowledge, but not concrete causal knowledge. I can grasp the concept of belief or out of fear without knowing how beliefs or fears are caused by an internal external factors impacting the nervous system. Most part of folk psychology that works successfully in predicting and explained behavior should be kept since they refer to what we want to know about or explain in psychology. Parts of folk psychology that do not work may eventually be eliminated or reduced to physical chemical accounts. Intentional systems theory, we approach each other as intentional system entities whose behavior can be predicted by the method of attributing beliefs, desires, and rational acumen according to the following principles. Systems of belief are those it ought to have given its perceptual capacities, its epistemic needs, and its biography. A system's desires are those it ought to have given its biological needs and the most practical means of satisfying them. The system's behavior will consist of those acts that would be rational for an agent with those beliefs and desires to perform. If one to ought to have means would have, if it were ideally esconded in its environmental niche, for example, it will recognize and avoid all dangers in its environment. Treating each other as intentional systems works because we are well designed by evolution and hence approximate to the ideal version of ourselves assumed by folk psychology. Beliefs, desire, and other entities postulated by folk psychology are abstracta, calculated beyond bound entities analogous to the equator which does not correspond to any actual thing on Earth's surface, thus beliefs are not things like brain processes. To the functionist notion that beliefs, for example, must be a lot of those real, functionally defined concrete things that play a role in causal interactions can be accounted for the idea that while most beliefs are really abstract or virtual, they pre-propose some complex of core beliefs that are indeed a lot of. Since beliefs are not identifiable things that function as causes, folk psychology does not do what science does, namely search for identifiable things or events that causally explain other events. We can separate folk psychology from science in two ways. First, we can develop intentional systems theories. Intentional systems theory assumes the usual notions of belief and desire while examining the behavior of systems, such as economic systems or even individual persons construed as complex. It avoids accounts of beliefs as isolated. The high level of generality of intentional systems theory is justified because we are interested in such facts as that certain bats and certain birds both avoid or dislike certain noxious insects, a fact which evolutionary biologists seek to explain. The fact cannot even be stated in terms of the physiology of the bird and the very different physiology of the bat, so we must keep the intentional description in order to motivate more detailed explanations. 
subpersonal cognitive psychology, more detailed explanations in terms of specific physical factors, such as nerve structures, the work of subpersonal cognitive psychology, in order for detailed descriptions of physical structures, such as the brain, to have any bearing on psychology, intentionally characterized behavior, they must somehow account for semantics or meaning. The aboutness of intentional includes the aboutness or meaning semantics of words. The brain is at best a synthetic engine. It operates upon inputs but physical traits, duration, location, shape, causal connection to structure, and other outputs that have no meaning. Thus, subpersonal psychology, in order to relate to accounts of thought and belief, must seemingly do the impossible, namely extract semantics meanings from syntax, meaningless shapes or sounds. Though semantics cannot be extracted from syntax, the synthetic system could mimic the behavior of intentional meaning-bearing system, and a man of will could be said to know intentionally it has enough to eat, and it, even if it, it has a physiological switch, which turns off its food acquisition behavior at the point where it has enough food to keep on living and thriving, the switch mimics knowing uh, varies in its activities reliable of what we call knowing it is time to stop eating. So given three kinds of intentional psychology, are any reductions possible? The notion of a Turing machine can be exploited to see how folk psychology might be reduced to intentional systems theory. Two devices, which are physically quite different, will be the same Turing machine state provided there is an abstract description of them in terms of machine table, which specifies the system of relations between inputs, programs, and outputs. Knowing the abstract description enables me to predict what computer will do given certain inputs. The abstract description works, but inquiry into physical structures is still relevant. So you have minds and machines, humans as machines, the Huxley, reminders about persons and machines, Wittgenstein and Ziff, minds, brains, and the Chinese room, Cyril, the reply to Cyril by Lycan, natural language, AI, and the existence, existential holism, a hoglin. The idea that humans are machines has been around for several centuries. Recent developments, particularly 20th century inventions, such as computers and robots that seem to think have lent greater credibility to the notion of the self as a machine, but many critiques of these have also been developed. So Huxley, humans are merely physical machine-like entities. Studies of non-human animals and brain-damaged humans support this claim. Human animal behavior amounts to mechanical reflexes caused by various inputs to the nervous system, which itself is set up by mechanical conditioning. If there is such a thing as consciousness, it is a mere epiphenomenon that has no causal effect on behavior. So Wittgenstein, reminders about machines and thinking, attributions of intelligence and feeling to mechanical devices, depend upon misleading analogies and logically inappropriate uses of concepts, like a robot feeling tired. In general, the background conditions necessary for attribution of feelings to anything are missing in the case of all machines. So minds, brains, and the Chinese room argument, human mental phenomenon cannot be replicated by any device operating on a formal program. To the Chinese room argument that we discussed in the previous slide, you know, AI program computers actually have, or our minds that is actually understand such things as stories and are in other cognitive states. Otherwise, put they have intentionality, grasp meaning, know what symbols are about, and so forth. Claims of strong AI are undermined by the Chinese room thought experience. Imagine uh, we had, uh, you know, in the previous discussion, we discussed the Chinese uh, room experiment. In the brain simulator or reply, imagine the, the room mirrors the actual structure of the brain, perhaps in terms of the system water pipes. The pipes are turned off and on according to program instructions so that the flow of mimics the firing of the neurons in the brain. There's no understanding of the simulator either. The person turning the valves knows no Chinese in the system so long as the, it instantiates a merely formal program, understands nothing, even if the end result is good answers in Chinese. Combination reply, imagine computer lodged in a robot that behaves in all the ways a human person does. It does not just produce marks on a paper, but fetches things and so forth. In such case, we would ascribe intentionality to it. So reply, we would describe intentionality to it unless we knew better. We would know better if we discovered that it was operating according to a formal program. We ascribe intentionality to non-human animal animals because we see that they're made of similar stuff to us and can make sense of their behavior by ascribing intentionality. However, if we discover that the behavior of an animal is resulting from the operation of a formal program, we would withdraw those descriptions. 
Human beings are indeed like complex machines. Perhaps we construct a machine that could understand stories. It would do so because it made of the right kind of stuff to causally produce perceptions, understanding, learning, and so forth. It would not be in such intentional states by virtue of instantiating program. However, what kind of stuff is in the right kind of stuff? That is an empirical question. Just the question of what kind of stuff can photosynthesize is empirical. The claims of strong AA are motivated by part of confusing information processing with understanding and knowing the notion of information is ambiguous. In one sense, there is information only where an outside interpreter makes sense of things such as sounds, squiggles, and rings on a tree trunk. In another sense, the sounds, squiggles, and rings are themselves information. Only in the second sense do program machines have information. In that sense, the processing of information does not involve any understanding, memory, and so forth. So the reply to Cyril by Lakin, machine functionality isomorphic to a, a human being could have intentionality. A machine will be functionally isomorphic to a human if it has functional components like those of a human. Something like the simulator reply might work. Suppose the system of water pipes works on its own and is housed in a being that produces output like ours. Why not ascribe intentionality to it? So I would answer first, if you look at the system, all you see is pipes, valves, where is the understanding? So Lichen's reply, if a tiny person were moving about in a real Chinese brain, that would only encounter neurons and might also wonder where the understanding is. The tiny person's view is too close, so to speak. So I would answer second, that even in such a functional isomorphic system, manipulation of formal element according to a program cannot produce understanding. Lichen replies by agreeing the system would have to have something more, namely interaction with an environment so that its beliefs were the result of the right kind of causal reactions. For example, the belief that there is a table here could not be ascribed to the machine unless the causes leading to that belief were like the causes leading to such beliefs in humans. So Lichen argues that all existing program devices lack intentionality because none of them have functional isomorphism and rich environments of the sort that produce the many different kinds of intention, states found in humans, but we could in principle produce devices of that kind. Natural languages, AI, existential holism, from Hoagland. Thesis, understanding requires locating particular bits of information in larger contexts. Computer programs cannot do that to the extent required for understanding a natural language. Types of holism, common sense holism. Holism is a name for the idea that parts can only be understood in light of the holes to which they belong. This is a, so for understanding a natural language, we understand the meaning of any given word by understanding its connection to other words in the sentences it occurs, the paragraph it occurs in, the story, in the terms of the whole network of common sense, as well as more specialized knowledge. To illustrate, consider common sense does not seem to be codifiable. We can write a routine for a machine that rules out certain kinds of nonsense, but it's not clear how we possess this uh, it of common sense. So as as to not take it as referring, you know, as, as we're coding a machine. Common sense is, in fact, extremely sophisticated and subtle and provides one important whole in terms of which we can understand natural languages. It was situational holism. Cues depend on deciding what features of the si situation are relevant to interpretation, are subtle and uncodifiable. It seems doubtful that it could be written into a program. A language translating program would have to choose between pen in the sense of a playpen in the sense of a fountain pen, since in print, for example, they're entirely different words. So according to Hoglin, there is no such program, probably will never be. So existential holism, the understanding of stories, antidotes, and much else depends on grasping what people care about and why what people care about is a function of how they think about and live their lives. For instance, the story of a snake and the farmer makes sense to us to the extent that we share attachments to children, care about prospects of living as a cripple, and might even accept being crippled as it meant saving our child's life. Since computers and robots lack such cares, attachments, and the like, they will not understand many stories, parables, and so forth. Those program machines are unlike humans. They cannot understand stories or even simple sentences. Okay, that's all my slide shares for tonight. We got eight people watching. Oliver D, you here? I'll take a break for a second and, and uh, delete uh, some of these PowerPoints from my computer. And maybe we'll see. I'll, I'll even do some of these. Uh, um, Maybe I'll, I'll even do a few of these papers. Just get get them off my uh, off my screen. So.
quite a bit of information there. I'm not sure if I get any comments from the chat. Any, uh, any in, anything interesting? I've been talking for almost two and a half hours straight, so I'm gonna rest my mouth for a second. Yeah, I'm trying to create an intellectual community here to uh, further analyze these things. I got quite a few, quite a few papers here. Let me see if any of these are quick enough to go through. Okay. There's a lot to know here. Like, um, you know, I'm trying to make community here around these complicated topics, and uh, you know, really, what I'm doing right now, I can't find anyone else doing. So, you know, to some extent, it's just my own private subject, uh, you know, study session. Um, I do this on my own. I, you know, I got shelves of books. I've read Dennett and a lot of these other people here. I study a lot of science. I almost became a doctor. I'm constantly reading articles. My dad gets all like the periodicals on the subject. Um, I love this stuff. I love talking about it. I guess let me check my sound. I might, I might try doing an article or two. So I'll put it back on uh, screen share. Get my little marijuana here to expand my consciousness, a drug of its own. Uh, help me understand what's going on inside of me by using a mind-altering substance. See if that helps. Let me see if I could get a few of these tabs closed. Okay. So... Okay, sorry about the dead space here. I've been talking for way too long, so it's it's hard to, you know, hard to keep uh keep talking for many hours straight. But I think it's worthwhile. These important subjects. So let's look at this first paper from uh, Moskowitz, Evers, and Giordano: The Problem of Hard Consciousness: Thoughts on Oscillatory Theory and Consciousness. The recent stuff just show you some of the very complicated uh, concepts that people are trying to use to understand uh, consciousness. So in this essay, we propose the hard problem of consciousness, the difficulty to equate physical brain states with corresponding phenomenal experience is part of an illusion deriving from the language that some philosophers and scientists use to describe where and how consciousness occurs. The scientific premises underlying our hypothesis is that the brain is oscillatory and not linear, and that comparisons between the brain in a linear computer are therefore misleading. We propose that given the uh, adequacy of this premise, consciousness in the human brain might be equated with cerebral oscillations. The proposition in line with other oscillatory theories in consciousness goes, but further in depicting consciousness as a nonlinear process that is chaotic, stoastic, or deterministic, highly organized and self-organized, unpredictable and difficult to measure. Against the backdrop we discuss implications of the theory, particularly whether given the conditions that we describe, it is possible to create a moral machine. 
So the hard problem of consciousness, the philosopher, cognitive scientist, Chalmers, we might read some Chalmers. Our problem to understand how consciousness happens with the knowledge argument, which declares that no matter how much is known about a state of a person's brain, it cannot objectively be known what it feels like for that person to experience any particular object, event, or relationship. So the philosophers that say consciousness happens will always be a mystery. So opposed to the anti-physicalist views of Chalmers, Jackson, and Quinn are those there who ascribe to a physicalist orientation and declare that science can and will equate consciousness, experience, and subjectivity with activity of the material brain. The anti-physicalists reply that this cannot be known, even though in the absence of brain activity one cannot prove the absence of consciousness. Since consciousness cannot be directly measured, this absence of subjective reports of its presence does not necessarily prove it exists. Advanced physicalist views on consciousness can be traced back to at least the 17th century and onward, a time in which dualism came under serious attack as natural science developed. Pioneer French materialist uh, Messier suggested that in order for matter to become conscious, its part would have to be organized in a specific manner, an idea that was taken up strongly in the Enlightenment. Um, then you had uh, Mitri published his influential work, La Hame Machine, Man is a Machine, The Atheism and Materialism, of which outraged not only the pious and dualistic orthodoxy, but even the famously tolerant Dutch who had offered a haven to Spinoza. Uh, Lemaitre's uh, blasphemy consisted precisely in rejecting classical dualism, suggesting the mental processes should be explained in a physiological terms because of consciousness in the bo is a bodily function. Voltaire coined the expression thinking matter in a letter of 1733. Uh, Diderot, 69, 1769, discussed a quite, in quite different modern terms the problem how matter needs to be organized in order for consciousness to develop. These and other ideas flourished during the French Enlightenment led to one of the most important events in human history, the weakening of the Catholic Church's political power and religious persecution of intellectuals and the academic freedom that was thereby enabled. Despite the powerful historical background, the 20th century tensions between physicalists and anti-physicalists might have remained an arcane oddity of academic disposition, were it not for the intersection of science, military tactics, art, and popular culture, there came artificial intelligence and Watson's IBM's computational system that beat humans in the television quiz game Jeopardy, which convinced many that machines are capable of human-like behavior. Their drones desire to create autonomous machine systems. They can affect decisions about human health, safety, and life. And comes Stoppard in the play, The Hard Problem. He dramatizes the ex existential conclusion that it doesn't matter if our mortal moral intuitions derived from nature, genetic, epigenetic, or neuropsychological sets of trait or nurture, and no matter how morality happens in consciousness, in the end, what matter is how we use our moral in intuitions, how moral intuitions and behavior control and make the right moral choice in spite of our appetites, emotions, and biases that will lead to a wrong action. For Stoppard, the really hard problem is understanding how to behave properly. So his play motivated this essay in which we seek to show the hard problem may not be so hard after all to the extent that by equating consciousness with cerebral activity, i.e. oscillations, the apparent inequality between a measurable physical state in the brain and in a measurable subjective state of consciousness becomes in part an illusion. The subjective state of mind is a cerebral state, albeit one that requires a subjective experience to be known from within, from the first person perspective, and the ontological identity makes them equally immeasurable. The specific inequality vanishes. The epistemological challenge remains across individuals. We cannot wholly know another's experience without merging with it. Um, the Evers and Sigmunds are distinct, which is individuals necessarily introduces a filter and interpretation that individuates our respective points of view. In other words, by virtue of our distinction, we have a private room that cannot logically be violated. The presence of this logical limit says nothing about the extension of our privacy, except that it isn't null. It does not ex exclude their unalienable privacy may be extremely small. The scientific position underlying the hypothetical philosophical view of consciousness is that the brain is oscillatory and not linear, and that the comparisons between the brain and a linear computer are therefore misleading. A linear linguistic approach 
is intuitively accessible, particularly when studying the perceptual apparatus. However, as neuroscientists, ethicists, and participants in the drama of the human condition, we are more concerned with moral decision-making. Therefore, once one abandons the linear concept of how consciousness happens, several conscious studies require review. And again, the background of that discussion, we shall conclude by discussing implications of the oscillatory theory of the conscious brain and the possibility of creating a moral machine. The oscillatory theories of consciousness, consciously variously referred to as the experience of perceptual contents, the subjectivity of the human condition, the feeling of what happens or the remembered present can be defined as the synchronous oscillation of massively interconnected, widely distributed circuits, networks, and systems of the global workspace of the body brain. What we know is awareness of the first person experience of what happens within and around us is probably oscillation of the nodal, nodal and harmonic frequencies of about 40 hertz. An oscillatory theory of consciousness is neither new nor novel. Bars developed the, the concept of global workplace more than a quarter of a century ago, proposing that consciousness does not happen in any set of places in the brain, in the brain, but rather it happens throughout the brain. The brain bioelectricity is oscillatory, has been evident since the 19th century work of Berger and Beck, which showed that the states of wakefulness and awareness are associated with various frequency bands of oscillation. Nonetheless, demonstrating the relationship between brain oscillation and consciousness has been much harder. Instruments for measuring brain function leave a wide gulf between temporal and space observation. Poor temporal spatial uh, concordance makes oscillatory behavior difficult to measure. Functional magnetic resonance imaging has relatively coarse temporal resolution, while the various forms of electro and so cephalographic lack the breadth of spa sa spatial sampling necessary to deserve oscillation in the global workspace. On premise, the consciousness is as oscillation of the global workspace follows the theories of several writers who describe mechanisms of consciousness in non-directional oscillatory terms, such as Francis Crick and Christopher Koch over 25 years ago. So, to understand oscillatory consciousness, philosophers and science will use terms like recursive, reentrant, reverber reverberating, binding, resonating to express dynamic and synchronous bioelectric activity of neural circuits, networks, and systems throughout the global workspace. Somehow, colloquially, one might imagine the brain not so much to snap, crackle, or pop with chains of isolated electronical discharges, but instead to hum. So the notion that consciousness, the experience of perceptual contents in or out of awareness, no more than less than a specific type of source of synchronous oscillation, meets with considerable resistance. Consciousness in the brain is too strong. Signature is a consciousness, not the thing itself. He almost entirely avoids the concept of synchronous oscillation in favor of linear descriptions of access consciousness. In our view, the linear approach derives from the concept of global nano workspaces originated by John Pierre and uh, you know similar to the theater and the stage. The word consciousness has many uh, denotations used symbolically to represent different things. An object, a state, an event or a relationship has been the subject of speculation and theory through the ages. Colloquially, consciousness is for some state of wakefulness for others it is the capacity to report experience and for yet others it is variously the remembered presence the feeling of what happens the experience of perceptual context the subjectivity of the human condition these latter four descriptions are essentially synonymous yet each adds nuance to something that seems like so much more than a bioelectric event namely the unique first person experience of the world that is subjective and can considerably measure be like no one else's experience So it's a pretty interesting article. You know, this one's 2018, very recent. So you see the most recent theories on how the brain could produce consciousness, this idea of um, oscillations and frequencies. You know, the hypercube example. So the idea of the brain is oscillatory, not linear in its organization. And function may appear counterintuitive for a number of reasons. First, neurons and neural systems have historically been viewed as linear schematics of on-off switches, wires, and connectors, although contemporary perspectives appreciate that they actually function both individually and in networks as nonlinear transform systems. Second, the peripheral nervous system 
is almost entirely linear in its operation. Sense organs transduce stimuli to bioelectric activity, which is transmitted to the spinal cord. Linear conductivity of reflex arcs in spinal thematic and thiamyl cortical circuits relay the neural representations of stimulus in the brain, mapping the interconnectivity of neurons and connecting them to input and output devices, sense organs, and end organs, which complete the characteristic of fully determined brain body that obeys the thermodynamic laws of Newtonian physics. Another reason consciousness oscillation makes seem counterintuitive is that humankind is prejudiced by the nature of language and how we use it. The substance of consciousness have been more the province of philosophy than science. This is unfortunate. The medium of philosophical discord in almost any discourse is language. It is symbolic representations, not the experience of the thing itself. The experience of objects, events, and relationships is reported and expressed with symbols. The symbols may be words, uh, paint, sculpture, models, any number of ways that quantify our observation. All symbols are linear. They exist in a Cartesian, Newtonian, three-dimensional words. We manipulate them with linear processes of language, writing, painting, modeling, computation. Linear skills and logic establish the foundation for creativity, but new ideas emerge from nonlinear intuition and imagination, not from logic. The gulf between the work of Newton and Einstein was largely conceptual, not mathematical. Assumption is a linearity prejudice, if not predetermined answers to questions about the nature of consciousness. This is, so we suggest that a more intuitive, accessible illustrations of the advantage of an oscillatory brain, brain and face recognition. So I encourage people to read through this. So the implications, there are important practical applications of studying if and when consciousness is present, understanding of consciousness happens also informs our understanding of moral decision making and the boundaries of strategy and coincidence. Oh, very interesting. Um, they're probably correct that, uh, you know, the brain is more oscillatory than uh, than uh, linear, you know, things are more complicated. Linear is a much easier way to understand things. And so obviously people want to understand things in a linear way, but you know, mo most likely that it is oscillatory, although that may or may not answer you know, the mind-body problem of duality. And the oscillatory principle could be related to the brain as a receptor and kind of like uh, vibrations and different understandings of uh, vibrations that we might get more into. I got another short one to get through. A lot of information here. Okay, this was an interesting article, and I actually pulled through quite a few links from it. I'll do one more. This is uh, from Ann. Article. Yep, okay, sorry about the background noise. No problem. Just one second, I'm gonna read through parts of this. It might be the last one I do. So here, and you know, Seth is at the Sackler Center for Conscious Science at the University of Sussex, the famous Sacklers from the um, oxycodone Pill wealth that have donated to this research. We we'll talk about Chalmers' influential distinguished distinction. It's, it's Cartesian in essence. You know the hard problem of cognition. He's saying here is supposed the real problem: how to account for the various pro properties of consciousness in terms of biological mechanisms without pretending it doesn't exist. The easy problem, and without worrying too much about explaining its existence in the first place, the hard problem. So just say, uh, you know, as we mentioned in the slides many different times, where we separate in the hard problem from the easy problem, and that the hard problem in reality doesn't exist, that we solve more and more of the easy problems and the hard problem will go away. 
it's called neural phenomenology. There's a historical parallels for this approach, like the study of life, biochemistry, to distinguish different aspects of consciousness, mapping their phenomenology properties onto uh, underlying biological mechanisms, distinguish between conscious level, conscious content, conscious self, Conscious level has to do with being conscious at all. Difference between being in a dreamless sleep and being vividly awake and aware. Conscious content is what populates your conscious experience, is when you are conscious, sight, sound, smells, emotions, thoughts, and beliefs that make up your inner universe. Among these conscious contents is the specific experience of being you. Conscious self, probably the aspect of consciousness that we all cling to most tightly. What are the underlying fundamental brain mechanisms that uh, give us this ability. So this article overviews a whole bunch of studies. That's why I'm going through it. And I've actually clicked on and I'm going to go through some of these studies also. Um, you know, the brain is stimulated by brief pulses of energy using a technique called a transcranial magnetic stimulation stimulation and his electro echoes are recorded by EEGs and dreamless sleep and general anesthetics. These echoes are very simple, like the waves generated by throwing a, st a stone into still water, but during conscious states, typical echo ranges widely over the cortical surface, disappearing and reappearing in complex patterns. Excitingly, we can now quantify the complexity of these echoes by working out how comprehensive they are. Similarly, how simple algorithms compress digital photos into JPEG files. The ability to do this represents a first step towards consciousness meter that is both practically useful and theoretically motivated. Complexity measures the consciousness have already been used to track changing levels of awareness across states of sleep and anesthesia. They can even be used to check for any persistence of consciousness following brain in injury where diagnosis based on a patient's behavior is sometimes misleading. Sackler Center, they're working to improve the practicality of these measures by computing brain complexity. On the basis of spontaneous neuroactivity, the brain undergoing echo without the need for brain stimulation, the promises the ability to measure consciousness, to quantify its comings and goings will transform our scientific understanding of the same way their physical understanding of heat depended on the development in the 18th century of the first reliable thermometers. As Lord Kelvin put it, in any physical science, the first essential step in the direction of learning any subject is to find principles and numerical reckoning and practical methods for measuring some quantity quality connected with it to measure is to know. So with the brain, what are we going to measure? Consciousness is informative in the sense that every experience is different from every other experience you ever had or ever could have looking past the desk in front of me through the window beyond. I never before experienced precisely this configuration of uh, coffee cups, computers, and clouds, an experience that is even more distinct when combined with all the other perceptions, emotions, and thoughts simultaneously present. Every conscious experience involves a very large reduction of uncertainty. At any time, we have one experience out of vastly many possible experiences. A reduction of uncertainty is what mathematically we mean by information. So consciousness is integrated in the sense that every conscious experience appears in a unified scene. We do not experience colors separately from their shapes nor objects independent of their backgrounds. The many different elements of my conscious experience right now are tied together in a deep way as aspects of a single encompassing state of consciousness. So the math captures this coexistence of information and integration maps onto the emerging measures of brain complexivity. There's no accident in this application of the real problem strategy. We're taking a description of consciousness at the level of subjective experience and mapping it to an objective descriptions of brain mechanisms. Some researchers take these ideas much further to grapple with the hard problem itself. Tony pioneered the approach, argues that consciousness is simply as integrated information. There's an intriguing and thoughtful proposal. When one it comes to the cost of admitting that consciousness could be present everywhere and in everything of philosophy known as panpsychism, the additional mathematical contortions needed also mean that in practice, integrated information becomes impossible to measure from any real complex system. This is an instructive example of targeting the hard problem rather than real problem to slow down or even stop experimental progress. So when are we conscious? We're conscious of something. The brain determines the context of consciousness. The standard approach to the question the so-called neurocorrelates of consciousness, the Francis Quick, Crick, and Koch 
define the neural correlates of consciousness, the middle set of neuron neuronal events and mechanisms jointly sufficient for a specific conscious precept. The, con the definitions serve very well of a post-scorgeous century because it leads directly to experiments where you can compare conscious perception with unconscious perception and look at the different brain activity using EGs or functional MRI, fMRI. There are many ways of doing this. The Experiments such as these have identified brain regions that are consistently associated with conscious perception, independently of whether that perception is visual, auditory, or some other sensory modality. The most recent chapter in the story involves experience to try to distinguish between those brain regions involved in reporting about a conscious precept from those involved in generating the conscious precept itself. But as powerful these explanations are, they do not really address the real problem of consciousness to say that a posterior cortical hot but, for instance, is reliably activated during conscious perception, does not explain why activity in that region should be associated with consciousness. For this, we need a general theory of perception that describes what brains do, not just where they do it. So 19th century German polymath Hemmelts proposed that the brain is a prediction machine and that what we see, hear, and feel are nothing more than the brain's best guesses about the causes of its sensory input. The brain is all it receives are ambiguous and noisy sensory signals that are out only indirectly related to the objects in the world. Perception must therefore be a process of inference in which indeterminate sensory signals are combined with prior expectations of beliefs about the way the world is to form the brain's optimal hypothesis of the causes of these sensory signals. We see the brain's best guess of what's out there. It's easy to find examples of predictive perceptions in the lab and in everyday life. Brains say evolved to assume, believe, you know, the origins of light, and perceptions of shape and shadow. People see what they expect rather than what violates their expectations. The classical view of perceptions is that the brain processes sensory information in bottom up or outside in direction. Sensory signals enter through receptors, then the process progresses deeper into the brain. With each stage recruiting the increasingly sophisticated and abstract processing, this view, the perpetual heavy lifting is done through these bottom-up connections. The Maltzian view inverses this framework, proposing that signals flowing into the brain from outside really convey only prediction errors. The difference between what the brain expects and what it receives, perceptual content is carried by perceptual predictions flowing to the opposite top-down direction from deep inside the brain out towards the sensory surfaces. Perceptions of all the minimization of the prediction error simultaneous across many levels of processing within the brain sensory systems by continuously updating the brain's predictions in this view, which is often called predictive coding or predictive processing. Perception is controlled the hallucinization in which the brain hypothesizes are continually uh, reined in by sensory signals arriving from the world and body, a fantasy that coincides with reality. And with this theory of perception, we can return to consciousness. Now, instead of asking which brain region correlates with consciousness, versus unconsciousness perception, we can ask which aspects of predictive perception go along with consciousness. A number of experiments are now indicating that consciousness depends more on perceptual predictions and then on prediction errors. 2001, Harvard Medical School asked people to report them perceived direction of movement of clouds and drifting dots. Um, they used uh, TMS to specifically interrupt top-down signaling across the visual cortex, and they found that this abolished conscious perception of the motion, even though bottom-up signals were left intact. More recently, in the, the lab here, we're probing the predictive mechanisms of conscious perception in more detail. Several experiments using variants of the binocular rivalry method mentioned earlier, we found that people consciously see what they expect rather than what violates their expectations. They also discover that brains imposes its perceptual predictions at preferred points or phrases within the so-called alpha rhythm, which is an oscillation in the EEG signal about 10 hertz that is especially prominent over visual areas of the brain. This is exciting because it gives a glimpse of how the brain might actually Im implement something like predictive perception because it sheds new light and well-known phenomena brain activity, the alpha rhythm, whose functions so far has remained elusive, like the last article we read, the oscillation theory. Predictive processing could also help us understand the unusual forms of visual experience, such as hallucinization that can accompany psychosis and psychedelic trips. The basic idea is hallucinations occur when the brain 
pays too little attention to incoming sensory signals so that perceptions become unusually dominated by the brain's prior expectations. Different sorts of hallucinations from simple geometric expressions of line, experiences of lines, patterns, and textures to rich hallucinatory narratives full of objects and people can be explained by the brain's over eagerness to confirm its predictions at several different levels in the cortical hierarchy. The research has significant clinical promises since it gets at the mechanisms that underlie the symptoms and of psychiatric conditions in much the same way that antibiotics tackle the causes of infection while painkillers do not. Of the many distinctive experiences within our inner universe, one is very special. This is the experience of being you, is attempting to take experience of selfhood for granted since they always seem to be present and we usually feel a sense of continuity in our subjective existence, except of course when emerging from general anesthesia, but just as consciousness is just one thing, conscious selfhood is also best understood as complex construction generated by the brain. There's the bodily self, which is the experience of being a body and having a particular body. This is the perspectival self, which is the experience of perceiving the world from a particular first point of view. The, uh, the volitional self involves experience of intention in our agency, of urges to do this and that, or being the causes of things that happen. At higher levels, we call narrative and social selves. The narrative self is where the I comes in the experience of being a continuous and distinctive person over time, filled from a rich set of autobiographical memories as a social self is that aspect of self-experience that is refracted through the perceived minds of others shaped by unique social milieu. In daily life, it can be hard to differentiate these dimensions of selfhood. We move through the world as seemingly unified wholes, our experience of bodily self seamlessly integrated with our memories from the past and with our experience of volition an agency, but introspection can be a poor guide. Many experiences in neuropsychological case studies tell a different story, one in which the brain actively and continuously generates and coordinates these diverse aspects of self-experiences. Experience of being and having a body are controlled hallucinations of a very distinctive kind. Let's take the example of bodily selfhood and the famous rubber hand illustration. I used to focus your attention on a fake hand while your real hand is kept out of sight. If you then simultaneously stroke your real hand, the fake hand with a soft paintbrush, you may develop the unkind feeling that the fake hand is now somehow part of your body. This reveals a surprising flexibility in how we experience owning our bodies and raises the question, how does the brain decide which part of the world are its body and which aren't? To answer this, we can feel the same processes that underlie other forms of perception. The brain makes its best guess based on prior beliefs and expectations and the available sensory data. In this case, the relevant sensory data in includes specific to the body as well as the classic sense such as vision and touch these bodily senses include uh proprioception which signals the body's configuration in space and interioception which involves a raft of inputs that convey information from inside the body such as blood pressure gastric tension heartbeat and so on the experience of embodied self it depends on predictions about body related causes of sensory signals across intercept and pro proprioceptive channels as well as across the classical senses our experience of being and having a body or control hallucinations Research in our lab is supporting the idea in one experiment we so-called augmented reality to develop a new version of the rubber. Oh, sorry. These findings take us back all the way to Descartes. Instead of I think, therefore I am, we can say I predict myself, therefore I am. The specific experience of being you is nothing more than the brain's best guess to the causes of self-related sensory signals. There's a final twist of the story. Predictive models are good not only for figuring out the cause of sensory signals, they also allow the brain to control or regulate these causes by changing sensory data to conform to existing predictions, sometimes called active inference. When it comes to the self, especially as deeply embodied aspects, effective regulation is arguably more important than accurate perception as long as our heartbeat, blood pressure, and other physiological quantities remain within viable bounds. It might, no matter if we lack detailed perceptions, representations as might have something to do with the distinctive character of experience of being a body in comparison with experience of objects in this world or of the body as an object. And this returns us one last time to Descartes and disassociate mind from body he argued non-human animals were nothing more than beast machines without any inner universe. In his view, basic processes of 
physiological regulation, had little or nothing to do with mind or consciousness. I've come to think the opposite. It now seems to me that the fundamental aspects of our experience of consciousness, self would might depend on control oriented predictive perception of our messy physiological, of our animal blood and guts. We are conscious selves because we too are beast machines, self stained flesh bags that care about their own persistence. Okay, excellent. So, finished up there with two of the most modern studies on the issue. And uh, I did, you know, less than half of the PowerPoints I had. And uh, I have a lot of articles left. There's really a lot of information on this. I mean, I've been studying this really my whole adult life. And, you know, this has been the greatest philosophers and minds ever have all put their thought into this. And uh, so it's pretty interesting, pretty exciting to do. I'll probably go tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow or, or the next day at the latest, and I'll watch through this. I'll add a table of contents, and uh, and I'll go on. You may, maybe Monday or Tuesday or even tomorrow night, I'll uh, do part two and part three. This is probably going to be three part with all the stuff I have here. So uh, you know, hope uh, some of you enjoyed this and are gaining from it. And if not, you know, just my public learning sessions, and I'm going to use this for my own benefit. I'm going to try to make a playlist out of this. So shalom, shavuto, blessings, namaste, Hare Krishna, whatever. Um, and, you know, let's keep at this. So have a great night.